Isaac Beshiba Singer, 1978 winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature, was born in Poland in 1904, the son and grandson of rabbis, and emigrated to the United States in 1935. A prolific author, with nine major novels and literally hundreds of short stories to his credit, Singer's early fiction dealt exclusively with the Jews of his native Poland. Over the years, the locale of many of his stories has shifted to America, but his subject matter has remained the same. Our book time selection is Enemies, a love story, the next to last of Singer's novels. It was first published in the Jewish Daily Forward in 1966, and then in English translation in 1972. It deals with the Yiddish-speaking Polish immigrant Herman Broder in the city of New York during the years immediately following World War II. But as the author tells us in his short introduction, it is by no means the story of the typical Holocaust survivor, his life and struggle. Like most of my fictional work, Singer writes, this book represents an exceptional case with unique heroes and a unique combination of circumstances. If they fit into the general picture, it is only because the exception is rooted in the rule. As a matter of fact, in literature, the exception is the rule. Enemies, a love story, episode one, adapted and read for book time by William Morantz. Herman Broder turned over and opened one eye. In his dreamlike state, he wondered whether he was in America, in Sivkev, or a German camp. He even imagined he was hiding in a hayloft in Lipsk. He knew he was in Brooklyn, but he could hear Nazis shouting. They were jabbing with their bayonets, trying to flush him out, while he burrowed deeper and deeper into the hay. The blade of a bayonet touched his hand. Enough! Herman sat up. It was mid-morning, and yet Viga had been up for some time. In the mirror on the wall opposite the bed, he caught sight of himself. Face drawn, his few remaining hairs, once red, now yellowish and streaked with gray. Blue eyes, piercing yet mild, nose narrow, cheeks sunken, the lips thin. There was a black and blue mark on his forehead. What's this? He touched the bruise. Could it have been caused by the bayonet in his dream? The thought made him smile. He had probably bumped it against the edge of the closet door on his way to the bathroom during the night. He stretched and called out in a sleepy voice, Hedviga! <clears throat> his wife appeared in the doorway. She was a Polish woman with rosy cheeks, pug-nosed, light-colored eyes. Her hair, light as flax, was combed back in a bun and held in place by a single pin. In one hand she held a dust mop, and in the other a small watering can. Shiksa, what time is it? It's late. I've done the laundry and the shopping. I've had breakfast, but I'm ready to eat again. Well, I'll get dressed. Don't walk around barefoot. I'll get your slippers. I polish them. You polish them again? Who polishes slippers? Ah, you're still a peasant from Lipsk. Though Yadviga was his wife, and the neighbors called her Mrs. Broder, she behaved towards Herman as if they were still in Tsivkev and she still a servant in the house of his father, Reb Shmuel Le Broder. Herman's entire family had been wiped out in the Holocaust. Herman was alive because Yadviga had hidden him in a hayloft in her native village of Lipsk. After the liberation in 1945, Herman learned from an eyewitness that his wife, Tamara, had been shot after their children had been taken away from her to be killed. Herman left with Jadwiga for Germany in the camp for displaced persons. Later, when he obtained an American visa, he had married her in a civil ceremony. Jadwiga had been prepared to adopt the Jewish faith, but it seemed senseless to burden her with a religion he himself no longer observed. As Herman stood before the medicine cabinet shaving, he began spinning a fantasy. The Nazis had come back into power and occupied New York. Herman was hiding out in the bathroom. Yet Viga had had the door plastered over so that it looked like the rest of the wall. Where would I sit? Here, on the toilet seat. I could sleep in the bathtub. No, too short. Herman examined the tile floor to see if there was enough room for him to stretch out. But even if he were to lie down diagonally, he would have to draw his knees up. Still, there was a window looking out on a small courtyard, and he'd have books and writing paper... Compared to the hayloft in Lipsk, it would be luxurious. The tub almost overflowed. These daydreams had taken on the character of obsessions. As soon as Herman was in the tub, Yadviga opened the door. Here's some soap. I still have a piece. Perfumed soap. Smell. Three for a dime. 
Hedviga smelled the cake of soap herself and handed it to him. Her hands were rough. Her neighbors in Brooklyn gave her all kinds of lotions to soften them, but they remained as calloused as a laborer's. In Lipsk, she had done the work of a man. Her calves were hard as stone. All the other parts of her body were feminine and smooth. Her breasts were full and white. Her hips were round. She looked younger than her thirty-three years. Come, I'll soap you. Yadviga started to soap his back, his arms, his loins. Herman had frustrated her longing to bear children, and so had taken the place of a child for her. Every time he went on a bookselling trip, she feared he would not come back. He would lose his way in the turmoil and vastness of America. His every homecoming seemed a miracle. What time does the train leave? What? Uh, at two o'clock. Yesterday you said three o'clock. A few minutes past two. Where is this city? You mean Philadelphia? In America, where should it be? Is it far away? In Lipsk it would be far. Here it's just a few hours by train. How do you know who wants to buy books? Herman was thoughtful. I don't know. I try to find buyers. Why don't you sell books here? There are so many people. You mean Coney Island? Here they come to eat popcorn, not to read books. What kind of books are they? Oh, different kinds. How to build bridges, how to lose weight, how to run the government. Books of songs, stories, plays, the life of Hitler. Hedviga's face fell. They write books about swine like that? They write about all kinds of swine. Yadviga had opened the door to the birdcage, and the parakeets were flying around the kitchen. The yellow parakeet, Voitus, perched himself on Herman's shoulder. He liked to pick at Herman's earlobe and nibble crumbs from his lips or the tip of his tongue. Yadviga was amazed at how much younger, fresher, happier Herman appeared after he had bathed and shaved. What's in the newspaper? Ah, they've made a truce, but it won't last. I'll start fighting again soon, those buffaloes. They never have their fill of it. Where is this? In Korea, China, you name it. Yadviga was silent a moment. She leaned on her broom. The neighbor with the white hair who lives on the ground floor says I can make twenty-five dollars a week in a factory. You want to go to work? I don't know English. You could take a course. I can enroll you in one if you like. The old woman said they don't accept anyone who doesn't know the alphabet. I'll teach it to you. When you're never home, Herman knew that she was right, and at her age it was difficult to learn. Generally, he understood her peasant Polish, but sometimes at night, when she was overcome with passion, she would chatter in a village gibberish that he couldn't follow. Could it be the speech of ancient peasant tribes, perhaps from pagan times? Herman had long been aware that the mind contains more than it gathers in one lifetime. He looked at his watch. Tonight I'll be eating supper in Philadelphia. Who will you be eating with? Alone. Herman replied in Yiddish. Alone. That's what you think. I'm as much a book salesman as you're the Pope's wife. <laughs> That faker of a rabbi I work for. Still, if it wasn't for him, we'd be starving. And that female in the Bronx is a sphinx altogether. But with the three of you, it's a miracle I haven't gone out of my mind. Talk so I can understand you. Why do you want to understand? In much wisdom is much grief," said Ecclesiastes. "The truth will be known not here, but in the hereafter, providing anything is left of our miserable souls. If not, we'll have to make do without the truth. More coffee? Yes, more coffee. Herman could get to the subway at Stillwell Avenue by walking down Mermaid, Neptune, or Surf Avenues, or by the boardwalk. Each of these routes had its attractions, but today he chose Mermaid. This street had an Eastern European flavor. Last year's posters announcing cantors and rabbis and the prices of synagogue seats for the high holy days still hung on the wall. From restaurants and cafeterias came the smell of chicken soup, kasha, chopped liver. The bakery sold bagels and egg cookies, strudel and onion rolls. In front of a shop, women were groping in barrels for dill pickles. As Herman walked along, his eyes sought hiding places in case the Nazis should come to New York. Could a bunker be dug somewhere nearby? Could he hide himself in the steeple of a Catholic church? Herman had never been a partisan, but now he often thought of positions from which it would be possible to shoot. On Stillwell Avenue, Herman turned right, and the hot wind struck him with a sweet smell of popcorn. Barkers urged people into amusement parks and sideshows. There were carousels, shooting galleries, mediums who had conjured the spirits of the dead for fifty cents. At the subway entrance, a puffy-eyed Italian was banging a long knife against an iron bar, 
calling out a single word, again and again. Passengers, mostly young people, streamed out of every train. In Europe, Herman had never seen such wild faces. But here the young seemed dominated by lust for enjoyment rather than mischief. The boys ran, screeching, shoving one another like rams. Many of them had dark eyes, low foreheads, and curly hair. There were Italians, Greeks, Puerto Ricans. The small girls with their broad hips and high breasts carried lunch bags, blankets, suntan lotion, and umbrellas. They laughed and chewed gum. When the train doors opened, Herman felt a blast of heat. The ventilators hummed, bare light bulbs dazzled the eye, newspapers and peanut shells were strewn on the floor. Someone had left a Yiddish newspaper on the seat. Herman picked it up and read the headlines. Stalin had been quoted as saying that communism and capitalism could coexist. On the inside pages, an escaped dissident gave an account of a slave labor camp in North Russia, where rabbis, socialists, liberals, priests, Zionists, and Trotskyites were dying of hunger and beriberi. The article ended with the promise that someday there would be established a system based on equality and justice that would cure the sickness of the world. So, they're still intent on curing. Herman dropped the newspaper to the floor and opened his briefcase. He took out a manuscript and read it, making notes. His livelihood was as bizarre as everything else that had happened to him. He had become a ghostwriter for a rabbi. He, too, promised a better world, in the Garden of Eden. The rabbi sold God like Abraham's father Terah had sold idols. Herman could find only one justification for himself. Most of the people who listened to the rabbi's sermons or read his articles were not completely honest themselves. Modern Judaism had one aim, to ape the Gentiles. The doors of the train opened and shut. Herman looked up each time. He was to have changed from the express to the local at Union Square and then get off at 23rd, but when he looked out, he saw that the train had already reached the 24th Street station. He got out and took the stairs to the opposite platform where he boarded a train going downtown. But again he missed the station and rode too far, to Canal Street. These mistakes in the subway, his habit of putting things away and not remembering where, Straying into wrong streets, losing manuscripts, books, and notebooks, hung over Herman like a curse. He was always searching through his pockets for something he had lost. He would buy an umbrella and leave it somewhere within the day. He would put on a pair of rubbers and lose them within the hour. Sometimes he imagined that imps and goblins were playing tricks on him. Finally he got to his office, located in one of the buildings owned by the rabbi. Rabbi Milton Lampert had no congregation. He published articles in Hebrew journals in Israel and Anglo-Jewish periodicals in America and England. He had book contracts with several publishing houses and was in demand for lectures at community centers and even universities. The rabbi had neither the time nor the patience to study or to write. He had amassed a fortune from real estate. He owned half a dozen convalescent homes and had built apartment houses in Borough Park and Williamsburg. Rabbi Lampert referred to what Herman did for him as research. Actually, Herman wrote the rabbi's books, articles, his speeches. No sooner had Herman crossed the threshold of his office than the telephone rang. He answered it, and the rabbi immediately began shouting at him. Where in the heck have you been? You were supposed to check in first thing this morning. Where's my speech for Atlantic City? You forget that I still have to go over it, in addition to everything else I have to do. And what do you mean by moving into a house that doesn't have a telephone? When a person works for me, I have to be able to get in touch with them, not have them stuck away in a hole like a mouse. Ah, you're still a greenhorn. This is New York, not Zivkev. America's a free country. You don't have to hide here. Unless you're making money illegally or the devil knows what. I'm telling you for the last time. Get a telephone or our business is goodbye. Wait, I'm coming over. I have to talk to you about something. Stay where you are. Herman began to write quickly in small letters. When he first met the rabbi, he had been afraid to admit that he was married to a Polish peasant. He had said he was a widower and had rented a spare room of a poor friend from the old country, a tailor who didn't have a phone. Herman's phone was under the name of Jadwiga Plach. It seemed that he had barely started before he heard heavy footsteps on the stairs. The rabbi opened the door. An enormous man with a red face, thick lips, a hooked nose and bulging black eyes, he wore a light-colored suit, yellow shoes and a gold tie with a pearl stick pin. He took the cigar from his mouth and flicked the ashes on the floor. Now you're starting to write. It should have been ready days ago. I can't wait like this until the last minute. What have you got scribbled there? It looks too long already. This is America, not Poland. A conference of rabbis isn't a meeting of the elders of Tzivkev. 
And what about that essay on the Baal Shem? There's a deadline. If you can't manage it, please tell me and I'll find someone else. Or I'll talk into a dictaphone and let Mrs. Regal type it. Everything will be ready today. Hand me the pages you've done. And once and for all, give me your address. I'm beginning to think you have a wife somewhere and are hiding her from me. Herman's mouth felt dry. I wish I had a wife. If you wanted one, you'd have one. I picked out a fine woman for you, but you won't even meet her. What are you afraid of? Nobody's going to drag you to the wedding canopy by force. Now, what's your address? Really, it isn't necessary. I insist that you give it to me. I have my address book right here. Well? Herman gave him an address in the Bronx. The rabbi began to write. He had insisted over and over that Herman should move. He had even offered him an apartment in one of his own buildings. But Herman had told him that the tailor with whom he lived had saved his life during the war and needed the few dollars in rent that Herman contributed. One lie led to another. Not only was Herman deceiving the rabbi, but Masha. He had convinced her that Yadviga was frigid and had made a solemn vow that as soon as Masha had divorced her husband, Leon Torchener, he, Herman, would free himself. Herman couldn't seem to help it. Yadviga's sheer goodness bored him. When he was with her, it was like being alone. And Masha was so volatile, hot-tempered, and neurotic that he couldn't tell her the truth either. The rabbi spoke without looking up from his notebook. What's your friend's name, the one you live with? Joe Pratch. Pratch? Where did a Jew get a name like that? How do you spell it? I'll have them put in a phone and tell them to send a bill to this office. You can't install a phone without his permission. If I'm paying, why should he care? The ringing frightens him. It reminds him of the camps. Have it put in your room. Lunatics, crazy people. This is why we have a war every few years. This is why Hitler's rise up. Rabbi Lampert softened his tone. I wanted us to be friends. I could help you a great deal, but you shut yourself up like an oyster. What secrets are you hiding behind those proverbial seven seals? Herman didn't reply at once. Anyone who's gone through all that I have is no longer part of this world. Clichés, empty words. You're as much a part of this world as the rest of us. You may have been a step away from death a thousand times, but so long as you're alive and eat and walk and, pardon me, go to the toilet, then you're flesh and blood like everyone else. I know hundreds of concentration camp survivors. They drive cars, they do business. You're playing a role, that's all. But why? You should be open with me, of all people. I am. What's troubling you? Are you sick? No, not really. Maybe you're impotent. That's all nerves. It's not organic. I'm not impotent. What is it, then? Well, I won't force my friendship on you. But I'm calling today and have them put in a telephone. Please, wait a while. For what? A telephone isn't a Nazi. It doesn't eat people. If you have a neurosis, see a doctor. Maybe you need an analyst. I have a friend, a Dr. Berchowski from Warsaw. If I send you to him, he won't overcharge you. Honestly, Rabbi, there's nothing wrong with me. All right, nothing. My wife also insists there's nothing wrong with her. But she's a sick woman all the same. She turns on the stove and goes shopping. She lets the water run in the tub and leaves the washcloth in so it should stop up the drain. I sit at my desk. Suddenly I see a puddle on the carpet. I ask her why she does these things, and she becomes hysterical. That's why there are psychiatrists. To help us before we get so sick that we have to be put away. Yes, yes. Well, wasted voids. Let's see what you've written. When Herman left the rabbi's office, he took the subway to the Bronx. Whenever he pretended to be on the road selling books, he spent the night with Masha. He had a room in her apartment. On the Bronx Express, all the seats were taken. Herman gripped a strap. Above his head, a fan whirred, but the air it stirred wasn't cool. At every station, new clusters of passengers pushed their way in. The air was saturated with the smell of perfume and perspiration. Makeup melted on the women's faces. Their mascara streaked and caked. Gradually, the crowd thinned. The train now rode above the ground, on the L. Through the factory windows, Herman could see black and white women moving briskly around machines. In a hall with a low metal ceiling, half-naked youths were playing pool. On a flat roof, a girl in a bathing suit lay on a folding cot, taking a sunbath in the setting sun. Even though the buildings didn't seem old, an air of age and decay hovered over the city. A dusty golden mist hung over everything, as if the earth had entered the tail of a comet. Masha and her mother, Shifrapua, lived on the third floor of a house with a broken porch and a vacant ground floor, the windows of which were covered with boards and tin. 
Herman climbed the three flights of stairs and knocked on the door. Marsha opened it immediately. She wasn't tall, but her slenderness gave you the impression that she was. Her hair was dark with a reddish cast, like fire and pitch. Her complexion was dazzling white, her eyes light blue with flecks of green. She had high cheekbones and hollow cheeks. A cigarette dangled from her full lips. Well, it's about time. Herman stepped into the kitchen. Where's your mother? In her room. She'll be out in a minute. Sit down. Here, I brought you a present. Herman handed her a small package. A present? You mustn't bring me presents all the time. What is it? A box for holding stamps. Stamps? That will come in handy. I have about a hundred letters to write, but weeks pass and I can't seem to pick up a pen. The excuse I give myself is that there are no stamps in the house. Now I won't have an excuse. Thanks, dear, thanks. But you shouldn't have spent the money. Well, let's eat. I've cooked something you like. Stewed beef and kasha. You promised me not to cook meat any more. I promised myself, too. But without meat, there's nothing to cook. God himself eats meat. Human flesh. If you had seen what I've seen, you'd know that God approves of slaughter. The door from the other room opened and Shifra Pua came in. Taller than Masha, a brunette with dark eyes, black hair streaked with gray, which she pulled back in a bun. She had a mole on her upper lip. Hairs grew on her chin. There was a scar on her left cheek, made by a Nazi bayonet. Although Herman had himself managed to survive the Hitler catastrophe, he could never figure out how these two women had been able to save themselves. He had met Masha and Schiffer Pua in Germany after the liberation. Masha was married to a Dr. Leon Torchener, a scientist who was said to have discovered some new vitamin. Masha, Schiffer Pua, and Torchener had preceded Herman to America. When he arrived in New York, he ran into Masha again. By that time, she had been separated from her husband, who, as it turned out, neither had made any discoveries nor had any right to the title of doctor. Herman and Masha had fallen in love when they were still in Germany. She swore that a gypsy fortune teller had predicted their meeting, describing Herman down to the smallest detail, and warning of the pain and troubles their love affair would bring. Shifrapua squinted like someone who comes from the darkness into the light. Herman, I hardly recognized you sitting there. Did I sleep long? Masha frowned. Who knows? I didn't even know you were asleep. She walks around the house as quiet as a mouse. There are real mice here, and I can't tell the difference. You're starting again. I don't really sleep, but a curtain falls over my mind and it turns blank. Shouldn't happen to you. What do I smell? Something burning? Nothing's burning, Mama. My mother has a peculiar habit. Everything she does herself, she accuses me of. She burns everything she cooks, and as soon as I make something, she smells it burning. If she pours herself a glass of milk, she lets it run over, and she warns me to be careful. Everyone is sane, just your mother is crazy. I didn't mean that, Mama. Don't put words in my mouth. Sit down, Herman, sit down. He bought me a little box to keep stamps in. Now I'll have to write letters. The Nazis forced me to do things for so long that now I can't do anything of my own free will anymore. Here in America, I've come to realize that slavery isn't such a bad thing. For getting things done, there's nothing better than a whip. I listen to her. Ask her what she's talking about. She has to say something contrary, that's all. She inherited from her father. May he rest in the Garden of Eden. I love to argue that family. My father, may he rest in peace, your grandfather used to say that Talmudic arguments are brilliant, but somehow they always end up proving that one is allowed to eat bread on Passover. How did Passover get into this? Mama, do me a favor and sit down. She's so shaky, I think she's going to fall at any minute. And she does fall. A day doesn't go by without her falling. So why didn't you let me die in peace? I was lying in a hospital in Lublin at death's door, and suddenly she appears to call me back from the other world. What did you need me for if you keep making up lies about me? Listening to you, people would think that I was crazy. You are, Mama, you are. I would need a barrel of ink to describe the condition she was in when I brought her out of Poland. But one thing I can say with a clear conscience, no one has ever tormented me the way she does. What have I done to you, daughter, to make you talk like this? You were healthy even then. May no evil eye befall you, and I was dead. I told her openly, I don't want to live. But she pulled me back to life with a fury. Why did you need me? It suited her fancy to have a mother, that's all. And that husband of hers. My daughter can read the most difficult books, but when it comes to people, she doesn't know her hands from her feet. I took one look at him and I said, Daughter, he's a charlatan. Now she's been left sitting here, a deserted wife, 
a grass widow forever. If I want to get married, I won't wait for a divorce. What? We're still Jews, not Gentiles. What's happening to the stew? Just let me take a look at it. Oh, my God. There's not a drop of water in the pot. I smelled it burning. They made a cripple out of me, those fiends. But thank God, I've still got my sense of smell. Masha alternated between a bite of food and a puff of her cigarette, tasting a bit of each dish and then pushing it away. But she kept passing food to Herman, urging him to eat. Pretend you're in your hayloft and Lipsk and your peasant has served you a piece of pork. Who knows what tomorrow will bring? It can happen again. Slaughtering Jews is part of nature. Jews must be slaughtered. That's what God wants. Daughter, you're breaking my heart. It's the truth. Papa always said that everything comes from God. You say it too, Mama. So if God could allow the Jews of Europe to be killed, what reason is there to think he would prevent the extermination of the Jews in America? God doesn't care. That's how God is. Right, Herman? Who knows? Who knows? That's your answer for everything. Someone must know. Daughter, are you going to let Herman eat in peace or not? First you burn the meat, and then you pester him with questions while he's trying to eat. It's all right. I wish I knew the answer. It could be that suffering is an attribute of God. If one agrees that everything is God, then we too are God. And if I beat you, it means that God has been beaten. Why should God beat himself? Eat up. Don't leave anything on your plate. Is that your philosophy? If the Jew is God and the Nazi is God, then there's nothing to talk about. Mama, bake the kochen. I'll bring you a piece. Daughter, first he has to eat the compote. What's the difference what he eats first? It all gets mixed up in the stomach anyway. You're a dictator, Mama. That's what you are. All right, bring him the compote. Shifrapur went to the stove. Herman lowered his voice. Really, you shouldn't argue with her so much. What does it accomplish? If my mother was alive now, I wouldn't talk back to her. You're teaching me how to act. I have to live with her, not you. Five days out of the week, you stay with your peasant. And when you finally come here, you start preaching. Ah, she infuriates me with her piety and narrow-mindedness. But tell me, how is your little peasant? Did you tell her you were going on a book-selling trip again? What else? Where are you today? In Philadelphia. What happens if she finds out about us? She won't find out. There's always a possibility. Don't worry, she will never separate us. I'm not so sure. If you can spend so much time with an illiterate goose, then you probably don't need anything better. And what's the sense in doing the dirty work of that swindler of a rabbi? At least become a rabbi and swindle in your own name? I can't do that. You're still hiding in your hayloft. That's the truth. Yes, it's the truth. There are soldiers who can drop a bomb and kill thousands of people but can't bring themselves to slaughter a hen. As long as I don't see the person I deceive, I can stand it. After supper, Herman went to his room. It was a tiny room with a single window overlooking a small yard. Below, there was grass growing in a crooked tree. The bed was rumpled. Books, manuscripts, and scraps of paper covered with Herman's doodles lay scattered about. Just as Masha was never without a cigarette, Herman was never without a pen or a pencil. Even in the hayloft and lips, he had written and made notes. Herman stretched out on the bed. His body was racked with pain. He suffered from rheumatism and sciatica. Sometimes he thought he was walking around with a spinal tumor. But he had neither the patience for doctors nor confidence in them. He gazed out the window. It was evening, but the sky was still light. A single star shone brightly, blue and green, near and far, with a glow and substantiality that baffled him. This heavenly body, if it was a body, twinkled with cosmic joy. It laughed at the physical and spiritual smallness of a being that possessed only a talent for suffering. During the war and in the years after, Herman had had time enough to regret his behavior to his family, but basically he had remained the same, without belief in himself or in the human race, a fatalistic hedonist who lived in pre-suicidal gloom. A disciple of Schopenhauer, Herman had determined, while still in his late teens, never to marry and bring a new generation into the world. He had told his dead wife Tamara of his resolve, but she had become pregnant, refused to have an abortion, and enlisted the aid of her family to force him into marriage. A boy was born. Three years after their marriage, Tamara gave birth to a girl. According to Otto Weininger, at the time considered by Herman to be the most consistent philosopher, 
a creature with no sense of logic, no memory, amoral, nothing but a vessel of sex. The door opened and Masha came in. She had a cigarette between her lips. She stood in the doorway inhaling. The glow from her cigarette made her face fiery and fantastic. She removed a book and a magazine from a chair and sat down. God in heaven, it's hot as hell in here. Despite the heat, Masha would not undress as long as her mother was awake. Shifrapua was in the kitchen washing dishes and mumbling to herself. She turned off the light and turned it on again. She recited the prayer to be said before retiring, took a sleeping pill, filled a hot water bottle. Masha listened to her every move, always on the alert should help be needed. Mother and daughter loved one another, yet held innumerable grudges against each other. Masha's father, Meyer Bloch, had considered himself a free thinker, but her mother, Shifapua, had remained devout. The concentration camp and displaced person camps had unsettled her orthodoxy, but in America her piety had intensified. She prayed three times a day and imposed restrictions on herself that she hadn't observed even in Warsaw. She was always lighting memorial candles for friends and relatives and saved money from her food budget to buy books about Maidenek, Treblinka, Auschwitz. Masha's separation from her husband and the affair she was carrying on with Herman were, to Shifapua, a continuation of the horrors that had begun in 1939. She had paid too little attention to Masha when she was growing up and when it would have been possible to instill the fear of God into her. But her greatest sin was to have remained alive when so many innocent men and women had been martyred. Shifrapua's room was dark now, but still Masha sat on the chair, smoking one cigarette after another. Herman knew that she was preparing some unusual story for their love play. Masha compared herself to Scheherazade. The kissing, the fondling, the passionate love-making were always accompanied by stories from the ghettos, the camps, her own wandering through the ruins of Poland. Sometimes it seemed to Herman that she must be making these stories up, but he knew that she was not a liar. Masha never tired of talking about Leon Torchiner and his trickery. He was everything at once, a pathological liar, a drunkard, a braggart, a sex maniac, a gambler who would wager the shirt off his back. The New York judge who had granted Masha's separation had ordered her husband to pay her fifteen dollars a week, but she had yet to see a penny. In fact, Torchiner used every device to get money out of her. He still telephoned her, wrote her letters, begged her to return to him. Herman could understand this obsession. Masha aroused powers and desires in him that he never knew he had. Their lovemaking was not just a matter of a man and a woman having intercourse, but a ritual that often lasted till daybreak. Herman warned her not to smoke in bed, but she would kiss him and blow smoke rings at him. Sparks from her cigarette would land on the sheet. She would chew gum, munch chocolates, drink Coca-Cola, bring Herman food from the kitchen. It reminded Herman of the ancient Jews who would recite the miracle of the exodus from Egypt until the morning star rose. Though neither of them were perverse, they talked endlessly to each other of unusual sexual behavior and perversions. Would she enjoy torturing a Nazi murderer? Would she make love to women if there were no men left on earth? Could Herman turn homosexual? Would he copulate with an animal if all humans had perished? Although she had had affairs of her own, Masha could not forgive Herman his former relationships, even with women who had died. Had he ever loved Tamara, the mother of his children? Had her body been more attractive to him than Masha's? And yet Viga, was she really as cold as he said she was? And if Masha were to die, how long would he wait before finding someone else? It was only since his affair with Masha that Herman had begun to understand why union, the joining of male and female, was so important in the Kabbalah. In the beginning was lust, the godly as well as the human principle is desire. Gravity, light, magnetism, thought were just aspects of the same universal longing. Suffering, emptiness, darkness were nothing more than interruptions of a cosmic orgasm that grows forever in intensity. Masha had to get up early to go to work at the cafeteria, but Herman slept late. When he awoke, the sun was shining and the sound of birds in the rumble of a delivery truck came through the open window. Shifapua had washed and ironed a fresh shirt for him. Even though she disapproved of her daughter's affair, she treated Herman like a son-in-law. She was impressed with his knowledge of Judaism. Even before he was dressed, she had started his omelette. Before eating, she insisted that he wash his hands from a pitcher according to the orthodox ritual. 
Now that Masha wasn't home, she gave him his hat to wear as he recited the prayers over the hand-washing and later the benediction. Masha was off work at noon, and Herman didn't have to go into the office. So, after a leisurely breakfast, he went to meet her. Herman entered the cafeteria through a revolving door and saw Masha. There she stood, the daughter of Meyer Bloch and Schifferpua, accepting checks, counting money, selling chewing gum and cigarettes. She caught sight of him and smiled. Masha still had twenty minutes to work, so Herman sat down at a table. He preferred a table next to the wall, or, if possible, in a corner between two walls, so that no one could come up behind him. At neighboring tables, men were openly reading Yiddish newspapers. It always seemed like a miracle to Herman. Masha finished her shift, gave the money and checks to the cashier who was relieving her, and came to Herman's table with her lunch on a tray. She loved spicy food, sauerkraut, dill pickles, mustard. She added salt and pepper to everything she ate, drank a coffee black without sugar. She took a sip of coffee and drew deeply on her cigarette. Well, how's my mother? Everything's all right. All right. I have to take her to the doctor tomorrow. When is your vacation? I'm not sure yet. Marja pushed her plate away. She had left three-fourths of her meal uneaten. Come, let's get out of here. You promised to take me to the zoo. The reputation of the Bronx Zoo had reached them even in Warsaw. On the way there, they stopped at the botanical gardens to look at the flowers, palms, cactuses, the innumerable plants grown in the synthetic climate of hothouses. It occurred to Herman that Jewry was a hothouse growth, thriving in an alien environment, nourished by the belief in a messiah, the hope of justice to come, the promises of the Bible, the book that had hypnotized them for three thousand years. At the zoo, two polar bears dozed in the shadow of an overhanging ledge by a pool of water, no doubt dreaming of snow and icebergs. The lion slept, from time to time lazily opening his golden eyes, which expressed the despondency of those who were allowed neither to live nor to die, and with his mighty tail swept away flies. The wolf paced to and fro, circling his own madness. The tiger sniffed the floor, seeking a spot on which to lie down. Two camels stood, immobile and proud, a pair of oriental princes. Herman often compared the zoo to a concentration camp. The air here was full of longing, for deserts, hills, valleys, dens, families. Like the Jews, the animals had been dragged here from all parts of the world, condemned to isolation and boredom. Some cried out their woes. Others remained mute. Parrots demanded their rights with raucous screeching. A bird with a banana-shaped beak turned its head from left to right, as if looking for the culprit who had played this trick on him. Chance? Darwinism? No, there was a plan or at least a game played by conscious powers. Herman was reminded of Marsha's remark about Nazis in heaven. Wasn't it possible that a Hitler presided on high and inflicted suffering on imprisoned souls, armed them with teeth, claws, horns, anger, and a hunger for each other's flesh and blood? They had to commit evil, or perish. Masha threw her cigarette away. What are you thinking about? Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Come, buy me an ice cream cone. In tomorrow's episode, Herman receives a shocking communication. Someone from the old country has come to New York, the last person Herman expected to see. Enemies, a love story by Isaac Singer, is adapted and read for book time by William Moretz. Since Herman planned to go away with Masha on her summer vacation, he was careful to tell Yadviga beforehand about the trip he would be taking to faraway Chicago. To make it up to her in advance, he took her on a one-day outing. Right after breakfast, they walked to the boardwalk, and he bought rides on the carousel. Yet Viga almost screamed when Herman sat her on a lion. He mounted a tiger. With one hand, she held on to the lion's mane, and the other, she held an ice cream cone. Next, they rode to Tilt-A-Whirl. Yet Viga fell on top of Herman and laughed with fright and glee. After a lunch of knishes, stuffed derma, and coffee, they strolled over to Sheepshead Bay and took a boat to Breezy Point. Hedviga was afraid that she might become seasick, but the water stayed calm. The breeze tousled her hair, and she tied it back with a kerchief. Music was playing at the pier where the boat docked, and Hedviga had a glass of lemonade. In the evening, after a fish dinner, Herman took her to a musical film full of dancing, singing, beautiful women, and magnificent palaces. 
He translated the dialogue so that she would know what was going on. Hedviga snuggled up close to him and held his hand. From time to time she would raise it to her lips and whisper, I'm so happy, so lucky. God himself has sent you to me. Next morning, Masha telephoned to say that her vacation had been postponed, so Herman told Yadviga that the Chicago trip had been canceled. Instead, he was going to Trenton, close by. On the subway to the Bronx, Herman was tormented by the foreboding of some disaster. Would he be taken sick? Would some misfortune befall Masha or Yadviga, God forbid? Maybe he'd be arrested or deported for failing to pay taxes. True, he probably didn't earn enough, but at least he should have filled out the form. That evening, Herman and Masha quarreled, made up, and quarreled again. As usual, their pillow talk abounded with promises they both knew would never be kept, with fantasies of pleasures not to be achieved. Often their conversations culminated with a talk of death. Masha urged Herman to acquire a cemetery plot so the two of them could be buried together. In her passion, she assured Herman that she would visit him in his grave and they would make love. How could it be otherwise? Next morning... Masha left for work, and Herman stayed in bed. As usual, he was behind in his work for Rabbi Lampert and resolved to finish the manuscript after breakfast. He had given the rabbi a false address at which to have the phone installed, but the rabbi was too preoccupied with his own business to remember. Rabbi Lampert was constantly making notes, but never consulted them. None of the old philosophers could have foreseen an age like this. It was a helter-skelter epoch. Work in haste, eat in haste, speak in haste, even die in haste. Herman dressed and went into the kitchen where, as always, breakfast was ready for him. Shifrapua was in the other room saying her morning prayers. She recited them slowly, syllable by syllable. A Yiddish newspaper lay on the table. Herman browsed through it as he drank his coffee. Suddenly, he saw his own name in the personal column. Mr. Herman Broder of Tsivkev, please contact Reb Abraham Nissen Yaroslaver. Herman sat rigid. He knew who Reb Abraham Nissen Yaroslaver was, an uncle of his dead wife, Tamara. When Herman had first arrived in America, Reb Abraham Nissen had wanted to help him, but Herman had avoided the old man. He didn't want him to know he was married to a Gentile. And here was Reb Abraham Nissen looking for him. What could it mean? Herman decided to pretend that he hadn't seen the ad. The telephone rang, and Shifra Pua answered it. Herman, it's for you, Masha. Masha said that she had to work an extra hour and would meet Herman at four. While they talked, Shifrapua picked up the newspaper, and when Herman hung up, she looked at him and pointed to the ad. They're looking for you in the newspaper. Here. Yes, I saw it. Call up. They give a phone number. Who is it? Who knows? Probably someone from the old country. Call them up. If they put it in the newspaper, it must be something important. Maybe some relative has shown up. There's no one left. Still, if someone has looked for it, it's no small matter. Herman came to the table and tore out the notice. He showed Shifrapua that there was nothing but another advertisement on the other side, so she would not miss any reading matter. They want me to join the Landsmannschaft, but I have neither the time for it nor the patience. Herman intended to go and sit on a park bench and go over the manuscript, but his legs carried him to a phone booth. He felt depressed and realized that the premonition he had experienced for the last few days had to do with this advertisement. He dialed the number given in the paper. He could hear the telephone ringing, but there was no answer. Well, it's better this way. I won't call again. Who is it? Hello? Herman's heart sunk. Even though he had only spoken to Reb Abraham Nissen once, he recognized the voice. He cleared his throat. This is Herman. Herman Broder? There was a moment of silence, as if Reb Abraham Nissen had been caught by surprise. Herman! You saw the notice in the newspaper? I have news for you, but don't be frightened. It isn't, God forbid, bad news. Don't be nervous. What is it? I have news of Tamara Rachel. Tamara, your wife. She's alive. Herman said nothing for a long time. Apparently, somewhere in his mind, he must have allowed for this possibility 
because he wasn't as shocked as he should have been. His own life had undergone so many bizarre quirks that he was almost beyond surprising. He heard himself say, How can this be? A witness saw her being shot. Yes, it's true, but she survived. She escaped to the house of a friendly Gentile. Later, she made her way to Russia. And the children? The children are gone. Again, the silence between them was long. Where is she now? Here, in my house. She's been here since Friday. She just knocked on the door and walked in. We've been looking all over for you. Just a minute, I'll call her to the phone. No, I'll come right over. Herman tried to hang up, but the receiver fell from his hand. As it dangled at the end of the cord, he thought he could still hear Rabbi Abraham Nissen's voice coming from it. He opened the door to the booth. At the counter, a woman was sitting on a stool, sipping a drink with a straw and flirting with a man who was serving her some cookies. Herman replaced the receiver and left the booth. Masha had often accused Herman of being a mechanical man, and now he acted like one. His feelings were dammed up, and his mind was calculating coldly. He was to meet Masha at four o'clock. He had promised Jadwiga he would be home in the evening. He still had the rabbi's manuscript to finish. As he stood in the doorway of the drugstore, customers going in and out bumped into him. He knew that every moment was precious, but was unable to move. He looked at his watch. The small hand pointed to the eleven and the big hand to the three, but their meaning didn't register. Masha couldn't leave her mother. Besides, he had no money. Until he got a check from the rabbi, he had less than five dollars to exist on. Herman went out and began to walk down the sidewalk. But he couldn't remember the way to the uptown train. He stopped in front of a mailbox. Tamara? Alive? This hysterical woman who had tormented him and whom he was about to divorce when the war broke out had risen from the dead. Herman felt like laughing. His metaphysical trickster had played his best joke yet. What would he tell Masha? Her mother would certainly mention the notice in the paper. A woman dropped a letter into the box and eyed Herman suspiciously. He began to walk. Bigamy. Yes, bigamy. In a sense, he could be accused of polygamy. Herman sat on the bus that went from Union Square to East Broadway and looked out the window. The neighborhood had changed since his arrival in America. Now many Puerto Ricans lived there. Whole blocks of buildings had been torn down. Still, one saw the occasional Yiddish sign and here and there a synagogue, a yeshiva, a home for the aged, a Jewish funeral parlor. The bus passed a Yiddish theater, a ritual bath, and a hall that could be rented for weddings or bar mitzvahs. Herman saw young boys with earlocks longer than any he had seen in Poland. On their heads they wore broad-brimmed velvet hats, it was in this section, and on the other side of the bridge in Williamsburg, that the fanatical Hungarian Hasidim had settled, continuing the old feuds. Herman began to think of Tamara. During the years he had thought her dead, he had tried to remember her good qualities, her thoughtfulness and devotion. He had often spoken to her soul and begged forgiveness for leaving her and neglecting the children. Still, he knew that her death had spared him misery. Even the years wasted in the hayloft had seemed like a respite from the grief Tamara had caused him. Herman no longer remembered what they had quarreled so bitterly about. Their marriage was an endless haggle in which one party had never been able to convince the other. Their disagreements had started from the very beginning. They had met in Warsaw, where Herman was enrolled in the School of Philosophy at the university, and she had been a biology student active in leftist causes. For a time, she was an ardent communist and even planned to go and live in Russia with their son. Later, she dropped communism and became a member of the Labour Zionist Party. When she was a communist, she wore a leather jacket, a la Cheka, and when she switched to Zionism, wore a star of David around her neck. She talked incessantly about the redemption of humanity, the plight of the Jews, the role of women in society. She praised books Herman considered little better than pulp, sang the latest hits with gusto, and attended the lectures of all the party demagogues. 
She was constantly celebrating, protesting, signing petitions, and raising funds for all sorts of causes. She seemed to Herman the incarnation of the masses, always following leaders, hypnotized by slogans, never really having an opinion of her own. Could she have calmed down? Let's see, how old would she be? Herman tried to figure out his wife's age, but couldn't. He only knew that she was older than he. Again, he felt like laughing. Had anyone ever been in such a predicament? No, trillions, quadrillions of years would have to pass before this combination of circumstances repeated itself. Some divine intelligence was conducting experiments on him similar to those the Nazi doctors had carried out on the Jews. The bus stopped and Herman got out. As he approached the house on East Broadway, he caught sight of his reflection in a store window. A man of slight build, somewhat taller than average, a bit stooped, wearing a battered hat and rumpled trousers. If only I were wearing my good suit. For the first time since his arrival, Herman experienced the common ambition of the refugee to show that he had achieved a measure of success in America. Those of Reb Abraham Nissen's ground floor apartment were hung with half curtains like those used in the old country. As Herman mounted the steps, he recalled what he had heard from a compatriot concerning the circumstances of the old man's arrival in America. In Lublin, Reb Abraham Nissen had owned a small establishment that published rare religious books. He had traveled to Oxford to copy an old manuscript that had been discovered there. In 1939, he had come to New York to enlist prenumerants for the printing of this manuscript and had been prevented from returning to Poland by the Nazi invasion. He had lost his wife, but remarried the widow of a rabbi. He had given up his plan to publish the Oxford manuscript, and had devoted himself instead to anthologizing the writings of the rabbis who had perished in the Holocaust. His wife, Shiva Hadass, helped him in this work. They had taken it upon themselves to observe mourning one day a week for the martyrs of Europe. Every Monday they fasted, sat in their stockinged feet on low stools and observed all the traditional rules of Shiva. Herman rung the bell and waited. He thought he heard whispering behind the door, as if those inside were debating whether or not to let him in. The door opened and an old woman, obviously Shiva Hadas, stood on the threshold. In her high-collared dress and bonnet, she looked exactly like the pious women of Poland. She was short, thin, had wrinkled cheeks, a sunken mouth, and wore a pair of spectacles on her hooked nose. There wasn't a trace of America in her appearance, or any indication of hurry or excitement. From her manner, one would think that such a reunion between a husband and a wife was an everyday occurrence. Herman greeted her, and she nodded. They walked on a long foyer without speaking. Herb Abraham Nissen stood in the living room, short, stocky, stooped, with a pale face, a full yellow-gray beard, and disheveled side-locks. He wore a flattened skull-cap, and a broad, fringed garment could be seen beneath his unbuttoned robe. He looked at Herman, and his gaze seemed to say, Words are superfluous. Then he glanced at a door that led to another room. Call her in. The old woman calmly left the room. Reb Abraham Nissen sighed. A miracle from heaven. The old woman seemed to be gone a long time. Again, Herman imagined he heard a whispered argument. Then, the door opened and Shiva Hadas led Tamar into the room like a bride to the wedding canopy. Herman took in everything at once. Tamara had aged a little, but still looked surprisingly young. She wore American clothes and had obviously visited a beauty parlor. Her hair was jet black, with the artificial sheen of fresh dye. Her cheeks were rouged, her eyebrows plucked, her fingernails red. She made Herman think of a stale loaf of bread that had been put into the oven to be freshened up. He heard himself say, I hope you recognize me. Yes, I recognize you. It was Tamara's voice, though somewhat changed, perhaps because of the guarded tone. Her baby Hamnissen gestured to his wife, and they both left the room. Herman and Tamara remained silent a long time. He stared at her. The same nose, the same cheekbones, the same chin, lips, eyes, ears. 
Then Herman noticed something he had forgotten, a crease at the corner of her mouth that combined vexation, suspicion, and irony. Why is she wearing pink? Herman was irritated that the woman who had seen their children taken away to be killed allowed herself to be dressed in this fashion. Now he was glad that he hadn't changed into his good clothes. His feeling of embarrassment had passed, and he was the old Herman again, the man who didn't get along with his wife, the husband who had turned away from her. I didn't know you were alive. That's something you never knew. Well, sit down. Here on the sofa. Tamara sat. She was wearing nylon stockings. She pulled down her dress, which had risen above her knees. Herman stood across the room from her in silence. It occurred to him that the spirits of the newly dead encountered each other in this fashion, speaking the words of the living, not yet knowing the language of the dead. How did you come here? By boat? No, by plane. From Germany? No, from Stockholm. Where were you all this time? In Russia? Tamara seemed to be thinking her answer over. Yes, in Russia. I didn't know that you were alive until this morning. An eyewitness came to me and told me you had been shot. Who was he? Nobody came out alive, unless he was a Nazi. He was a Jew. It can't be. They shot two bullets into me. One is in my body to this day. Tamara indicated her hip. Can't it be removed? Perhaps here in America. Where did it happen? In Alachev. In a field on the outskirts. I managed to get away at night. It was raining or else the Nazis would have seen me. Who is the Gentile who hid you? Pavel Shoshonsky. My father had done business with him. I went to him thinking, what could possibly happen now? At worst, he'll report me. He saved your life. I stayed there for four months. They couldn't trust a doctor. He was my doctor. He and his wife. Have you seen them since? They're no longer alive. They were both silent. How is it that my uncle didn't know your address? We had to put an ad in the paper. I don't have my own apartment. I live with someone else. You could have left him your address. What for? I don't see anyone. Why don't you? Herman wanted to reply, but the words wouldn't come. He pulled a chair from the table and sat down on the edge of it. In the bus, he had imagined that Tamara would ask these questions. Nevertheless, he sat in stunned silence. Where do you live? What do you do? Herman flushed. I didn't know you were alive, and... Tamara smiled wryly. Who is the lucky woman who has taken my place? She isn't Jewish. She's the daughter of a Pole in whose house I hid. A peasant? Yes. Tamara looked at him but didn't answer. She had the absent expression of someone who is saying one thing but thinking another. What kind of work do you do? I work for a rabbi, an American rabbi. What do you do for the rabbi? Answer questions on ritual law. I write books for him. And what does he do? Dance with shikses? I see you've already learned a great deal in this country. There was an American woman in our camp. She had come to Russia looking for social justice and was immediately packed off to a camp. She died of diarrhea and starvation. I have the address of her sister somewhere. Ah, I would need a whole year just to go around telling relatives how this one died, how that one died. People know a little, a drop in the ocean about what the Nazis did. But the world knows nothing about what Stalin did, and is still doing. What happened to you? Tamara bit her lip. She shook her head as if to indicate the futility of relating what was beyond belief. This was not the garrulous Tamara Herman had known, but a different person. The odd thought occurred to him that perhaps this wasn't Tamara, but her sister. What happened to me can never fully be told. So much happened that sometimes I imagined that nothing happened. We sawed logs in the forest, twelve, fourteen hours a day. At night it was so cold that I couldn't sleep at all. 
It stank so I couldn't breathe. Many of the people suffered from very berry. One minute a person would be talking to you. The next he would be silent. You spoke to him and he didn't answer. He moved closer and saw that he was dead. So I lay there and asked myself, why didn't I go with Herman to Tsivkev? But I couldn't recall a thing. This, they tell me, is a psychological illness. Sometimes I remember everything, sometimes nothing. The Bolsheviks taught us to be atheists, but I still think everything is predestined. It was fated that I should have to stand by and watch those monsters rip out my father's beard and a piece of cheek as well. Anyone who did not see my father at that moment doesn't know what it means to be a Jew. My mother fell at their feet and they trampled on her with their boots and spat at her. They would have raped me, but I was having my period. And you know how I bleed. No, oh, later it stopped. It stopped all right. Where does one get blood if one doesn't have bread? Ah, you ask what happened to me. A speck of dust that's been blown over land and desert can't tell you where it's been. Who was the Gentile who hid you? It was our servant. You know her. Yadviga. You married her? Tamara looked as if she were about to laugh. Yes. Forgive me, but wasn't she simple-minded? Your mother used to make fun of her. I remember her telling me that she didn't even know how to put on a pair of shoes. She tried to put the left shoe on the right foot. She saved my life. Was that the only way you could repay her? Well, I'd better not ask. Tamara stared at her leg. She raised her dress slightly and scratched her knee, then quickly pulled her skirt down over it. What did you say your job was? A writer for a rabbi? Yes, in a way. I'm also a book salesman. Herman found himself lying out of habit. What kind of books do you sell? Yiddish books? Yiddish, English, Hebrew. I'm a so-called traveling salesman. And what does your wife do when you travel? What do other wives do? Here in America, selling is a big profession. Do you have any children by her? Children? No. It wouldn't surprise me if you did have. I met young Jews who married former Nazis. And when it comes to talking about what some girls did to save their skins, ah, I'd better be quiet. So what can surprise me any more? Where did she hide you? I told you, in a hayloft. And her parents didn't know. She only has a mother and a sister. They didn't know. Of course they knew. Peasants are crafty. They figured out that after the war you'd marry her and take her to America. I assume you crawled into bed with her even when you were with me. I didn't crawl into bed with her. You're talking nonsense. How could they know I would get a visa to America? They knew, they knew. Yet Viga may be an idiot, but her mother talked it over with the other peasants and they helped her figure it out. Don't think I'm angry with you. How could you know I was alive? You didn't even write to me during those last few weeks, knowing that war was about to break out at any moment. Oh, I know of fathers who risked their lives crossing frontiers to be with their children. Men who escaped to Russia turned themselves over to the Nazis out of longing for their families. But you crept into a hayloft with your lover. How can I even pretend to have any claims on such a person? So, why don't you have any children with her? I don't, and that's that. Why do you look at me like that? You married her. Since my grandfather's children weren't good enough for you, and you were ashamed of them as if they were scabs on your scalp, why shouldn't you have children by Yadviga? Her father was certainly a finer man than mine. Well, for a moment I thought you had changed, but I see you're still the same. No, not the same. The Tamara who left her murdered children and fled to Russia is another Tamara. I am dead, and when his wife is dead, a man may do as he pleases. It's true, this body of mine is still dragging itself about. It has even dragged itself to New York. They put nylon stockings on me, dyed my hair, polished my fingernails. You should excuse me, but the Gentiles have always prettied up their corpses. And Jews nowadays are Gentiles. So I bear no grudges against anyone. I wouldn't have been surprised to hear that you had married a Nazi, one of those who had danced on corpses and ground their heels into the eyes of Jewish daughters. How can you possibly know what went on lying in your hayloft with your peasant? I just hope you're not playing the same tricks on your new wife that you played on me. Well, the impossible is possible. It's really happened. Herman walked down 14th Street muttering to himself. He stopped at a drugstore to phone Yadviga. All the booths were occupied. 
One man gesticulated as he talked, as if the party on the other end could see him. A second talked and smoked while lining up the coins he needed to prolong the conversation. A girl laughed and kept looking at her scarlet fingernails, as if the conversation concerned her nails, their color and shape. Apparently each of the callers was involved in a situation that demanded explanations, apologies, subterfuge. Their faces expressed deceit, curiosity, worry. At last the booth became vacant. Yadviga answered on the first ring. Yadzia, darling, it's me. Oh, yes. Where are you calling from? From Baltimore. Where is that? Well, it makes no difference. A few hundred miles from New York. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, very well. I'm trying to sell books. Are they buying? It's hard work, but they're buying. I'm going to spend the night here in Baltimore and then go on to Washington, which is even further away. But I'll call you. The telephone doesn't care about distance. Electricity carries the human voice 180,000 miles a second. Herman didn't know why he was giving her this information. Perhaps he wanted to impress her with how far away he was so that she wouldn't expect him home too soon. Has anyone been to see you, one of the neighbors? No, but a man came to the door with a machine that sucked up dirt. He wanted to show me how it worked, but I said I couldn't let anyone in without you. You did the right thing. Where will you eat supper? Philadelphia, I mean Baltimore, is full of restaurants. Don't eat meat. You'll ruin your stomach. It's ruined anyhow. Go to bed early. Yes, I love you. When will you be home? Not before the day after tomorrow. Come soon. It's lonesome without you. I miss you too. I'll bring you a present. Herman hung up with a sigh. How was it that such goodness could survive in this corrupt world? It was a mystery, unless one believed in the transmigration of souls. Herman almost choked on a mouthful of potatoes and shav when Masha asked him about the relative who had gotten in touch with him. He couldn't remember the name he had given her. Yes, I didn't even know this relative of mine was alive. Is it a man or a woman? I told you, a man. You tell me a lot of things. Who is he? Where is he from? The name Herman had invented came back to him. Fiva Lemberger. How is he related to you? On my mother's side. How? He's the son of her brother. Your mother's maiden name is Lemberger? It seems to me you told me something else. You're mistaken. You said he was a man in his sixties. How can your mother have such an old nephew? She was the youngest. Her brother was twenty years older than she. What was his name? Tovia. Tovia? Ah, the whole thing sounds fishy. It's an old girlfriend from Tsivkev. She missed you so much that she put an ad in the paper. Why did you tear it out? You were afraid I'd see the phone number. Well, I bought another paper. I'm going to call up right now and find out the truth. This time you've hung yourself with your own belt. Herman pushed his plate away. Why don't you call up then and end this cross-examination? Go ahead, dial the number. I'm sick of your ugly accusations. Masha's expression changed. I'll call when I feel like it. Don't let your potatoes get cold. If you haven't any faith in me at all, then our whole relationship is senseless. It's senseless, all right. You have your shiksa, you have me, and some bitch from Europe shows up and you can't wait to run off and meet her. A whore like that probably has syphilis, too. Shifrapua came to the table. Why don't you let him eat? Mama, don't interfere. I'm not interfering. Are my words nothing to you? When a person is eating, you don't bother him with complaints. I know a case where someone, God protect us, choked to death. Do you have a story for everything? He's a liar, a faker. He's even too stupid to know how to get away with it. If he's your cousin, why did you refer to him as a distant relative? Herman picked up a small potato with his spoon. It was round, new, moist with butter, sprinkled with parsley. It was strange. In spite of his distress, he felt calm. It was the resignation of the criminal caught red-handed who accepts the inevitability of punishment. To me, all relatives are distant. Herman lay on his bed, alternately dozing and brooding. It was the longest summer day he could remember. It was so hot in his room he wondered why it didn't burst into flame. Masha would soon know the truth. Rabbi Lampert would surely fire him. 
Where could he go? What could he do? He had only two dollars in his pocket. He thought of Tamara sleeping on the sofa in Rev. Abraham Nissen Yaroslavr's living room. She had asked for his address and phone number, but he had put her off with a promise to call the next day. As worthless as he was, people depended on him. What was it they all wanted? To forget for a while their loneliness and the inevitability of death. Herman dozed off. When he awoke, he could hear Masha talking on the telephone. Was she talking to Reb Abraham Nissen? Or Tamara? He strained to hear. No, she was talking to the other cashier at the cafeteria. After a few minutes, she came into the room. Herman, I can take my summer vacation now. Starting when? We can leave Sunday morning. Herman was silent. All I have is two dollars and a few pennies. Aren't you supposed to be getting a check from the rabbi? I'm not so sure now. I'm behind in my work. You did it deliberately. All year you've promised to take me to the country, but at the last minute you change your mind. You want to stay with your peasant. Or perhaps someone else. Did you put that notice in the paper yourself? It wouldn't surprise me. All I need to do is dial the number. I'll soon know your tricks. Go ahead. For a few cents you'll know the truth. Who did you go to see? My dead wife Tamara has risen from the grave. She's polished her fingernails and come to New York. Yes, of course. Well, I don't need you. Sunday morning I'm going to pack my bags and go wherever my eyes lead me. If I don't get out of the city for a few days, I'll lose my mind. Wait, I have to get a cigarette. Masha left the room. Herman got up and looked out the window. The sky shone pale and dull. The earth rotated on its axis as it had from time immemorial. The Milky Way turned at the edge of the galaxy. And in the midst of these cosmic events, Herman stood with his ridiculous little troubles. Masha returned a cigarette between her lips. If you want to come with me, I'll pay for you. Do you have the money? I'll borrow it from the Union. You know I don't deserve it. No, but if you need a thief, you rescue him from the gallows. It was three days later. Herman had finished a manuscript and delivered it to the rabbi, promising not to be late again. Fortunately, Rabbi Lampert was too busy to ever carry out any of his threats. He took the manuscript and paid Herman at once. The two telephones on his desk kept ringing. He was flying that day to Detroit to give a lecture. When Herman left, the rabbi didn't give him his whole hand to shake, just two fingers. Herman immediately took the rabbi's check to the bank and cashed it. Then he phoned Rabbi Abraham Nissen, Yaroslavers. When Tamara opened the door, the first thing Herman noticed was that she had removed the polish from her nails. She was wearing a dark-colored dress and looked older. He noticed a few white hairs and there were wrinkles at the corners of her eyes. He hadn't kissed her at their first meeting and made a gesture to do so now. But she moved away. My uncle and aunt just left. Come in. I'll make some tea. The cinnamon cookies had surely been baked by Shiva Hadas. They were not uniform in shape, but twisted and crooked like the homemade cookies in Tsivkev. Tamara watched Herman bite into one. Ah, I keep looking at you, but I can't believe it's really you. You won't believe me, Herman, but I lie awake at night and can't remember how we first met or how we grew close. We can never be strangers. Ah, you don't mean that. You're only saying it. You consoled yourself very quickly with your mother's maid. Tell me, is she at least a good wife to you? You always had a million complaints about me. What can I expect of her? She does the same things she did when she was our servant. Are you at least faithful to her? Or do you have six others? Herman paused. Do you want me to confess everything? Herman, you can tell me the truth. In the first place, we were once related. And in the second place, as I told you, I no longer consider myself part of this world. The truth is, I have a mistress. Tamara smiled fleetingly. Ha! I thought so. After all, what can you talk about with Yadviga? She's a right shoe on a left foot. Who is your mistress? From over there, from the camps. Why didn't you marry her instead of a peasant? She has a husband. 
They're separated, but he won't give her a divorce. Ah, see, nothing's changed with you. Absolutely nothing. What sort of a person is your mistress? Why didn't you get along with her husband? Ah, he's a faker, a parasite, an outcast. He's given himself the title of doctor and takes money from old women. Forgive me, but what did you get in exchange? A man with two wives who writes sermons for a fake rabbi? Did you tell her about me? Not yet. But she read the notice in the paper and is suspicious. She may call here any time. What shall I say if she calls? That I'm your sister? That's what Sarah said to Abimelech about Abraham. I told her a cousin of mine had shown up. A man called Fievel Lemberger. Shall I tell her that I'm Fievel Lemberger? Tamara burst into laughter. Her eyes lighted up with a gaiety that Herman had never noticed before, or had perhaps forgotten. He rose, and she too stood up. Tamara, it's not our fault that the world went to pieces. Ah, what do I have to hope for? To be a third wheel on your broken wagon? Herman, let's not spoil the past. We shared many years. With all your carryings on, those were still my happiest years. Suddenly, Tamara moved close to Herman and kissed him on the mouth. It happened so quickly that he didn't have time to return the kiss. He tried to embrace her, but she moved away quickly, indicating that she wanted him to go. Tomorrow's episode, Herman goes on vacation with Masha and is hit by another bombshell. Enemy. Herman and Masha took a bus to the Adirondacks and, after a six-hour trip, got off at Lake George. They had started out with no plan at all. Herman had found a map of New York State on a park bench, and this was his guide. He mused on how fantastic it was to be in America, a free country, without fear of Nazis, NKVD, border guards, informers. He hadn't even bothered to bring his first papers. In the United States, no one asked to see your documents. They found a room for seven dollars and decided to spend the night. Their room looked out over a lake and hills. Masha stood at the window, smoking and watching the rowboats and motorboats on the lake. Where are the Nazis? What kind of world is this without Nazis? A backward country, this America. She was in a playful mood. She had bought a bottle of cognac with part of her vacation pay and filled two paper cups. Herman only took one sip of his, but Masha kept refilling hers. She had learned to drink in Russia. With a cigarette hanging from her lips, she raised her arms and began to dance in her slip and nylon stockings. She reminded Herman of the circus performers that used to come to Tsivkev. She held out her arms to him and called in a drunken voice, Come, you shiver boy. Let's see what you can do. They spent the following night at Scroon Lake in a bungalow near the water. It was so cold they had to put their clothing over the blankets to keep warm. At breakfast, flies, bees, butterflies flew in through an open window. To Herman, these were not parasites to be driven away, but individual manifestations of the eternal will to live, experience, comprehend. A butterfly hovered over a piece of toast. The folded wings reminded Herman of a prayer shawl. An ant crawled across the table. It zigzagged back and forth, paused, then continued. But where to? Like Herman, it had separated itself from the anthill and had to make out on its own. From Schoon Lake, Herman and Masha went to Lake Placid. They found a room in a house on a hill. Everything in the house was old but spotless. On the wide bed lay thick pillows like the ones in European inns. The window looked out over the mountains. Herman could never quite forget that on a street between Mermaid and Neptune Avenues, Jedviga was waiting. He thought about Tamara lying awake on the sofa in her uncle's, staring into the darkness, waiting for any crumb he might throw her way. But here, surrounded by the deep blue sky and yellow-green water, he felt less guilty. Warm breezes carried the fragrance of the woods and the smell of dinner being prepared in hotel kitchens. Herman imagined that he heard the shriek of a duck or a chicken. Somewhere on this lovely summer morning, fowl were being slaughtered. Treblinka was everywhere. 
That night before dinner, Herman went downstairs to use the phone. He had taught Jadwiga how to accept a collect call. Ordinarily, she was uncomplaining, but tonight she was agitated. She was afraid at night. The neighbors laughed at her and pointed their fingers. Why did he need so much money? She was more than willing to go to work so that he could stay home like other husbands. Herman calmed her and promised not to stay away too long. She sent him a kiss over the phone, and he made a kissing sound in return. When he came upstairs, Masha wouldn't speak to him. Now I know the truth. What truth? I heard you. You miss her. You can hardly wait until you're back with her again. She's all alone, helpless. And what about me? They ate supper in silence. Masha handed him a hard-boiled egg, and Herman was reminded of the last meal before the fast of Tishabov, when one partakes of a hard-boiled egg sprinkled with ashes as a sign of mourning, and a symbol that one's luck can roll like an egg and turn bad. Herman and Masha stopped at a resort hotel not far from the Canadian border. Women and men in bathing suits were playing cards outdoors. On a tennis court, a rabbi wearing a skull cap and shorts played tennis. In a hammock between two pine trees, a young boy and girl lay, giggling incessantly. The girl wore a tight bathing suit, and a star of David dangled from her neck. The guests all ate together at long tables in the hotel dining room. The proprietress had assured Herman that the kitchen was strictly kosher, and the guests all one big family. At lunch, scantily clad mothers stuffed food into their children's mouths, determined to bring up tall Americans, six-footers. The little ones cried, gagged, and spat up vegetables that had been forced down. The tennis-playing rabbi spouted witticisms. The waiters, college and yeshiva students, joked with the older women and flirted with the girls. The women at the table engaged Masha in conversation. They wanted to know when she and Herman had been married, how many children they had, what Herman's business was. Herman lowered his head. There was always the possibility that someone might know him in Yadviga from Brooklyn. He could swallow neither the chopped liver and onions, the fatty piece of beef, nor the stuffed intestine. The women at the table complained. What kind of a man is he? He doesn't eat. An elderly man from Galicia latched on to the name Broder and began to cross-examine Herman. Did he have family in Lemberg, in Tarnov, in Brody, in Drohobich? He seemed determined to prove that the two of them were related. The women all commented on Masha's beauty, her slender figure, her clothes. When they learned that she had made the dress she was wearing, they wanted to know if she would sew for others. They all had clothing that needed to be let out, taken in, lengthened, shortened. Although he had eaten little, Herman rose from the table with a feeling of heaviness in the pit of his stomach. He had only one desire, to get away as quickly as possible. That night they all gathered in the casino, a remodeled barn. The Yiddish poet gave a speech praising Stalin and recited proletarian poetry. An actress did impersonations of celebrities. She cried, laughed, screamed, made faces. A Yiddish vaudeville performer told smutty jokes about a gullible husband whose wife had hidden a Cossack under the bed, and a rabbi who had come to preach to a fallen woman and left her house with his fly open. The women and young girls doubled over with laughter. Herman felt sick. He wondered what it was he had in common with these people. In what way were they his brothers and sisters? In what did their Jewishness consist? In what did his Jewishness consist? He glanced around and saw Masha dancing with an enormous man in green shorts that exposed his hairy thighs. She was laughing at a joke he had told her. With all her negativism, Masha had retained the normal instincts. She loved music, the theater. She wanted a husband, children, a household. But in Herman there was a sorrow that could not be assuaged. He was not a victim of Hitler... He had been a victim long before Hitler's day. The door was open and moths flew in, attracted by the bright lights, deceived by the false day. They fluttered about for a while and then fell dead, having beaten themselves against the wall or singed themselves on a light bulb. After a moment's hesitation, Herman slipped out without letting Masha see him. When Herman returned from his walk, the casino was dark. After some difficulty, he found his bungalow and went in. Masha was waiting for him. That night their lovemaking was uncharacteristically brief. But Herman was unable to sleep. He lay in bed and stared at Masha. Who was she? Did he know her? Even her features seemed unfamiliar. He'd never really studied the structure of her nose, her chin, her forehead. Her eyes seemed to be smiling behind the lids. 
What was going on in her mind? Suddenly she shuddered and sat up. I just saw my father. There was an awkward silence. Then Marcia said, What day of the month is it? Herman told her. It's been seven weeks since I've had my visitor. At first, Herman didn't know what she was talking about. The women in his life each referred to her menstrual period by a different name. The holy day, the guest, the monthly. Are you sure? Positive. And it's never late with me. As abnormal as I am in other respects, in this I am 100% normal. Should you see a doctor? They can't tell so soon. I'll wait another week. There was an awkward silence. Then Masha said, In America, an abortion costs $500. And it's dangerous, too. A woman who worked in the cafeteria had one. She got blood poisoning, and that was the end of her. What would my mother do if anything happened to me? I'm sure you would let her starve. Don't get melodramatic. You're not dying yet. How far is living from dying? I've seen people die, and I know. Herman awoke, frightened and perspiring. How long had he slept? One hour? Six? The bungalow was pitch black and icy cold. Masha was sitting up in bed. Her pale face was like a spot of light in the dark. Herman, I'm afraid of an operation. It was a few moments before Herman realized what she was talking about. Well, all right. Maybe Leon will divorce me. I'll speak frankly to him. I can't divorce Jadwiga. You can't? When the King of England wanted to marry the woman he loved, he gave up his throne. And you can't get rid of a stupid peasant. You know a divorce would kill her. I know nothing of the kind. There's no law that can force you to live with her. The worst that can happen is that you'll have to pay alimony. I'll pay the alimony. I'll work overtime and pay. Tell me, were you married to the bitch by a rabbi? No, in a civil ceremony. That's not worth a thing according to Jewish law. Marry me in a Jewish ceremony. I don't need a goisha papers. No rabbi will perform a marriage without a license. This is America, not Poland. I'll find a rabbi who will. It would still be bigamy. No one will know. We'll move out of the house and you can use any name you like. You have to register a child. We'll work something out. If your peasant is so dear to you that you can't live without her, then go spend one day a week with her. I'll make peace with that. There was a tense silence. Then Masha continued in a different tone of voice. Herman, I've been sitting here and thinking for an hour. If you won't agree, you can leave here this minute and not come back. I'll find a doctor who will perform the operation, but I don't want you to show your face to me again. I'll give you one minute to answer. If it's no, then get dressed and get out. I don't want you here another second. You're asking me to break the law. I'd be afraid of every policeman in the street. You're afraid now. Answer me. Yes. Masha was silent for a long time. Are you just saying that, or will I have to start all over again tomorrow? No, it's settled. Good. First thing in the morning, I'll telephone Leon and tell him he must give me a divorce. If not, I'll destroy him. What will you do? Shoot him? I'm capable of that, too, but it won't be necessary. Legally, he's as unkosher as pork. If I wanted to report him, he'd be deported tomorrow. Masha got out of bed and started to move about in the dark. A bluish light shone in through the window. The birds started chirping. Herman got up and opened the door. Dew had settled on the grass and a milky mist hung over the lake. On the branch of a tree near the bungalow, three young birds kept their soft beaks wide open while the mother bird fed them little bits of stems and worms from her beak. She flew back and forth with the single-mindedness of those who know their duty. The sun rose behind the lake. A pine cone fell, ready to fructify the earth, bring forth a new pine. Masha walked outside in her bare feet, a cigarette between her lips. I've wanted your child since the day we met.
With yesterday's episode, we came to the end of part one of Isaac Singer's Enemies, a Love Story. The author has left his beleaguered hero on the horns of a three-pronged dilemma. With a Polish wife in Brooklyn, a resurrected Jewish wife in Manhattan, and a married mistress in the Bronx, Herman Broder was given the news that the latter, Masha, was pregnant. So naturally, he agreed to marry her, too. But before settling down with his third wife, Herman couldn't resist one last fling with his first. As part two opens, he's preparing to leave for the Catskills where Tamara has rented a bungalow at a resort hotel. Herman had made up a new lie about going on the road to sell the Encyclopedia Britannica. Since Jadwiga didn't know the difference between one book and another, the lie was superfluous. But Herman had gotten into the habit of making up stories. Besides, lies wore thin and had to be repaired from time to time. Lately, Jadwiga had began to grumble about him. The women in the house had been talking to her, trying to convince her that her husband had a mistress somewhere. One old woman had advised her to consult a lawyer, get a divorce, demand alimony. Herman had had to lie to Masha, too. He told her that he was going with Rabbi Lampert to Atlantic City. Since even Reformed rabbis didn't hold conferences during the days of awe, it was a lame excuse. But Masha, who had succeeded in getting Leon Torchner to give her a divorce, had stopped making jealous scenes. The divorce and her pregnancy seemed to have changed her outlook. She had found a rabbi, a refugee who had agreed to perform the ceremony without a license when the ninety-day waiting period was over. The ride to the Catskills took almost the whole day. It was still summery weather, but the days were getting shorter. Herman sat with his face pressed up against the window pane and thought about Tamara. She had offered to give him a divorce if he needed one. But Herman saw in her return a symbol of his mystical beliefs. Whenever he was with her, he re-experienced the miracle of resurrection. It even played with the notion that Tamara was not really among the living, that it was her phantom who had returned to him. Suddenly a brightly lit hotel materialized out of the woods. On the veranda, men and women were playing cards. In spite of the stiffness in his legs, Herman bounded up the stairs with vigor. Tamara appeared, wearing a white blouse, dark skirt, and white shoes. She looked tanned and younger. She ran towards him and took his suitcase. Why did it take so long? Tamara's words, her familiar Polish-Yiddish accent, shattered Herman's occult fantasies. This was no specter from the other world. She took Herman's arm. Are you hungry? They've kept supper for you. The tables were already set for breakfast, but Herman could hear someone puttering around in the kitchen. Tamara disappeared and reappeared a short time later with a young man who carried Herman's supper on a tray. Tamara joked with the man, and he answered her in a familiar way. Herman noticed that he had a blue number tattooed on his arm. The waiter left, and Tamara became silent. The youthfulness and even the suntan that Herman had noticed seemed to fade. Shadows and the hints of pouches appeared under her eyes. Did you see that boy? He was at the very doors of the ovens. In another minute, he would have been a heap of ashes. Tamara had had a rollaway cot brought into the room for Herman, but neither of them could sleep. Herman had dozed off for a moment, then awakened with a start. The cot creaked. You aren't sleeping? Oh, I'll fall asleep. I have some sleeping pills, if you like. No, Tamara, I'll get along without. Why should you toss and turn all night? If I were lying with you, I would sleep. Tamara did not speak for a time. What's the sense of it? I'm a corpse, Herman, and one doesn't sleep with a corpse. And what am I? You have a wife. I thought you were faithful to Yadviga, at least. I told you the whole story. Yes, you told me. It used to be that when someone told me something, I'd know what he was talking about. Now the words roll off me like water on oilcloth. If you aren't comfortable in your bed, come into mine. Herman crawled under the covers and felt the warmth of Tamara's body. She lay on her back, motionless. He lay on his side, facing her. He lay still, as embarrassed as a bridegroom on his wedding night. The blankets were too tight, but he was afraid to ask her to loosen them. Tamara sighed. How long is it since we've lain together? It seems like a hundred years. It's less than ten. Really? To me, it's been an eternity. 
Only God could cram so much into so short a time. I thought you didn't believe in God. After what happened to the children, I stopped believing. Where was I at this time in 1940? Oh, yes, in Russia, in Minsk. I sold burlap sacks in a factory and lived in the suburbs among the Gentiles. When Yom Kippur came, I decided I was going to eat. What was the sense of fasting there? Also, it wasn't wise to show the neighbors that you were religious. But when evening came and I realized that somewhere Jews were saying Kol Nidra, the food wouldn't go down. You said that little David and Yochav had come to you. Herman regretted the words as soon as they were out of his mouth. Tamara didn't move, but the bed started to groan, as if it was shocked by his presumption. You won't believe me. I'd better not say anything. I believe you. Those who doubt everything are also capable of believing everything. Even if I wanted, I couldn't tell you. There's only one way to explain it, that I'm crazy. When do they come? In your dreams? I don't know. I told you I don't sleep but sink into an abyss. I fall and fall and never reach bottom. Then I hang suspended. Ah, I experience so many things that I can neither remember nor tell anyone about. Perhaps I should go to a psychiatrist. But how can he help me? All he can do is give these things a Latin name. The children, yes, they come. Sometimes they visit till morning. What do they say? Ah, oh, they talk all night. But when I wake up, I don't remember any of it. But a feeling remains that they still exist somewhere and want to be in contact with me. Sometimes I go with them or I fly. I'm not sure which. We come to a border and I can't cross. They tear themselves away from me and float over to the other side. I can't remember what it is, a hill, some barrier. Sometimes I imagine I see stairs and someone is coming to meet them, a saint or a spirit. I also hear music, but it's a kind of music without sound. Ah, whatever I say, Herman, it won't be accurate, because there are no words to describe it. Naturally, if I'm mad, then it's all part of my madness. You aren't mad, Tamara. Well, that's nice to hear. Does anyone know what madness really is? The children never talk about me. I think they do, but I'm not sure. For a moment, the silence was total. Even the crickets grew still. Herman heard a gushing sound like a running brook, or was it a drain pipe? A stomach rumbled, but he wasn't sure whether it was his or Tamara's. He felt the urge to scratch, but restrained himself. Tamara, I want to ask you something. Even as Herman spoke, he didn't know what he was going to ask. What? Why did you remain alone? Tamara didn't answer. Herman wondered if she might have dozed off. Herman, I've already told you that I don't consider love a sport. I can't have to do with a man I'm not in love with. Does that mean you still love me? I didn't say that. During all those years, you didn't have a single man? Herman was ashamed of his own words and the agitation they evoked in him. Supposing there had been someone, would you jump out of bed and walk back to New York? No, Tamara. I wouldn't even consider it wrong. You may be perfectly honest with me. And later you'll call me names. No. As long as you didn't know I was alive, how could I demand anything? The most devoted widows remarry. I suppose you're right. Then what is your answer? Why are you trembling? You haven't changed one bit. Answer me. Yes, I did have someone. Tamara's voice sounded almost angry. She turned on her side with her face towards him, thereby moving somewhat closer to him. When? In Russia. Everything happened there. Who was it? A man, not a woman. Herman felt his throat tighten. One? Several? You don't have to know every detail. If you told me this much, you might as well tell me everything. Well, several. How many? Really, Herman, this isn't necessary. Tell me how many. It was quiet. Tamara seemed to be counting to herself. Herman became filled with grief and lust. He was amazed at the caprices of his body. One part of him mourned for something irrevocably lost, while another part of him yearned to plunge itself into this treachery, 
to wallow in its degradation. Three. Three men? I didn't know you were alive. You had been cruel to me. I knew that if you were alive, you would do the same. In fact, you married your mother's servant. You know why. There were wise in my case, too. Well, you're a whore. Tamara made a sound like a laugh. Didn't I tell you? And she stretched out her arms to him. Herman felt someone shaking him. He opened his eyes in the dark and didn't know where he was. Yadviga? Masha? Then he remembered. What is it? I want you to know the truth. Tamara sounded like she was barely able to hold back her tears. What truth? The truth is that I had no one. Not three men, not one, not even half a man. You're lying. I'm not lying. I told her the truth the very first time when you asked me. But you seemed disappointed. What's wrong with you? Are you perverse? I'm not perverse. But since you talk so easily out of both sides of your mouth, I'll never be able to believe you again. So don't believe me. Herman, you know how sacred the memory of our children is to me. I swear by Jochebed and David that no other man has touched me. If you don't believe me now, then I beg you, leave me alone. God himself couldn't force a stronger vow from me. I believe you. Herman, there's something else I want to say to you. I beg you, don't interrupt me. Before I came here, the doctor at the American consulate examined me and told me I was in perfect health. I had survived everything, the camps, the hunger, the epidemics. But, Herman, I have nothing to live for. Over there, I still had some hope. Actually, I had planned to settle in Israel, but when I found out that you were still alive, everything changed. Now I'm entirely without hope, and one dies of that more quickly than of cancer. Tamara, I too am without hope. My only prospects are imprisonment and deportation. Why should you be imprisoned? You haven't robbed anyone. Herman told Tamara of all his entanglements. Even in the dark, he imagined he could see her puzzled, ironic smile. Well, Mazel Tov, you're going to be a father again. I'm going crazy. That's the bitter truth. Yes, you can't be in your right mind. You should never have come to me under these circumstances, but talking consistency to you is like discussing colors with a blind man. Tell me, are you just frivolous, or is it that you enjoy suffering? I'm caught in a vice, and I can't free myself. Well, you'll soon be free of me. I'll give you a divorce. You can talk to the rabbi in the morning. You can also get rid of Yadviga. Give her her fare and send her back to Poland. Tamara, she saved my life. Is that why you want to destroy her? A peasant has to work, have children, go out into the fields. I'll stay cooped up like an animal in a cage. She sits all alone in the apartment. She can go out of her mind that way. And what would happen to her if, God forbid, you were put in prison? Herman didn't reply. It had begun to grow light. Tamara's face was beginning to take shape out of the darkness, a patch here, a patch there, like a portrait in the process of being painted. On the wall opposite the window, the sunlight cast a spot that resembled a scarlet mouse. Herman suddenly became aware of how cold it was in the room. Lie down. You'll catch your death. Don't worry. The devil isn't taking me away so fast. Nevertheless, Tamara lay back down, and Herman covered them both with a blanket. He embraced her, and she did not resist. They lay together without speaking, overcome by both the complexities and the contradictory demands of the body. The fiery mouse on the wall grew paler, lost its tail, and vanished. For a while, night returned. <laughs> In Isaac Singer's novel, Enemies, a Love Story, currently being featured on Book Time, Herman Broder has had two summer vacations, one with his legal wife, Tamara, and the other with his pregnant fiance Masha. But now it is early autumn, the time when the farmer reaps the harvest of the seed he has sown in the spring. Shifra Pua had bought two sacrificial hens for Yom Kippur. She had wanted to buy a rooster for Herman, but he had forbidden it. How could an innocent fowl be used to redeem the sins of a guilty human being? 
Why should a compassionate God accept such a sacrifice? Herman had often pointed out that what the Nazis had done to the Jews, man was doing to the animals. For once, Masha agreed with him. But Jifferpua swore that if Masha refused to perform the ceremony, she would leave the house. After reluctantly agreeing and twirling the bird above her head, uttering the prescribed prayers, Masha refused to take the bird to the ritual slaughterer. Shifrapua had to do it herself. No sooner was she out of the house than Masha burst into tears. I can't take any more of this! I can't! I can't! Herman handed her a handkerchief and she ran into the bathroom. He could hear her muffled crying. Later she came back into the room carrying a flask of whiskey. She was half laughing, half crying with the mischievousness of a spoiled child. It occurred to Herman that as her pregnancy progressed, she was becoming inappropriately babyish. She was full of little girl mannerisms, giggly, even playfully naive. He remembered Schopenhauer's statement that the female never really becomes fully mature. The bearer of children herself remains a child. Hedviga hadn't performed the ritual hand-twirling ceremony, but fasted on Yom Kippur. She paid for a ticket at the synagogue with ten dollars that she had managed to save out of the household money. Herman fasted but did not go to the synagogue. He sometimes prayed to God, when he wasn't feuding with him, but to stand in a house of God with a holiday prayer book in his hand and praise him in accordance with a prescribed ritual. This he couldn't do. The neighbors knew that Herman the Jew stayed home while his Gentile wife went to pray. He could visualize them spitting at the mention of his name. Generally, when he was home alone, he would immediately phone Masha. But on Yom Kippur, she did not talk on the phone. He went to the window. The boardwalk was deserted. The leaves were beginning to turn and fell with each gust of wind. On Mermaid Avenue, all the shops were boarded up. It was so quiet that from his apartment he could hear the roar of the surf. Perhaps it was always Yom Kippur for the sea, and it also prayed to God. But its God was in its own image, flowing eternally, infinitely wise, boundlessly indifferent. Herman went into the bedroom and stretched out on the bed. He didn't want to admit it, but of all his fears, the greatest was of becoming a father again. He was afraid of a son and more afraid of a daughter, who would be an even stronger affirmation of the positivism he had rejected, the bondage that had no desire to be free, the blindness that wouldn't admit that it was blind. Yadviga awakened him when she came home from the synagogue. She told him excitedly that the cantor had sung Kol Nidra and the rabbi had delivered a sermon soliciting funds for yeshivas in the Holy Land and other Jewish causes. Hedviga had pledged five dollars. She bent over him and he saw in her eyes the expression he used to see on the face of his mother during the high holidays. Her lips trembled as if she were about to speak, but no sound came from them. Then she whispered, I'm going to become Jewish. I want to have a Jewish child. Herman had eaten breakfast and was sitting at a table in the living room working. He was writing a chapter of a book entitled Jewish Life as Reflected in the Shulchan Aruch and the Responsa. It had already been accepted by publishers in America and England. Rabbi Lampert was about to sign a contract from a French firm as well. Herman wrote a few lines and paused. As soon as he sat down to work, his nerves would begin to sabotage him. He grew sleepy. He had to have a drink of water. He needed to urinate. He became conscious of a crumb between his teeth and tried to get it out, first with his tongue, then with a thread drawn from the binding of the notebook. Hedviga was in the basement doing the laundry. In the kitchen, Wojtas was delivering a lecture to Mariana, who was perched beside him in the birdcage. The telephone rang. What does she want now? Herman had just spoken to Masha half an hour before. She had said she was going to Tremont Avenue to shop for the remaining days of the holiday. He lifted the receiver with a sigh. Yes, Marshala. Herman Broder? Herman's mouth became dry. He couldn't decide whether or not to hang up. Was it a police detective? Had his big meat been discovered? Who is this? The caller replied in Yiddish. I beg you to listen to me. My name is Leon Torchiner. I am Marsha's former husband. Herman entered the cafeteria and saw Leon Torchiner sitting at the table by the wall. He recognized him from a photograph he had seen in Masha's album. 
He was a man of about fifty, large-boned with a square-shaped head and thick, dark hair that was obviously dyed. He had a broad face, a wide nose with large nostrils, bushy eyebrows, and a scar on his forehead that looked like an old knife wound. It seemed unbelievable that this boor had once been Masha's husband. But that was the way with facts. They punctured every bubble of conceit, shattered theories, destroyed convictions. A cup of coffee and a dish with a half-eaten egg cookie was set in front of Torchner. Seeing Herman, he made as if to rise, but then fell back into his chair. Herman came up to the table. Herman Broder. Torchner reached out a large, heavy hand, and Herman took it. Shalom Aleichem. Sit down, sit down. I'll bring you some coffee. No, thanks. Tea? No, thanks. I'll get you some coffee. Since I invited you, you are my guest. Herman watched Torchner pick up a tray and take his place in line at the counter. He was too short for his broad build, with overly large hands and feet, and with the shoulders of a stevedore. That's the way they grew them in Poland, more in breadth than in height. He returned with a coffee and a cheesecake. I have to watch my weight. That's why I'm only having an egg kuchel. But you can afford a piece of cheesecake. Torchner sat down, picked up his almost extinguished cigar, puffed at it vigorously, and blew out a cloud of smoke. I debated whether or not to call you for a long time. One doesn't do a thing like this lightly. How did you get my number? What's the difference? I have it, and that's what counts. Don't let your coffee get cold. Eat a piece of cheesecake. If you must know, I saw it in the marshal's address book. She has a habit of outlining important phone numbers with circles and little drawings of flowers and animals. She drew a whole garden of trees and snakes around your number. Torchner started to fuss with his cigar. I have every reason to be your enemy, but I'll tell you right off. I'm here for your sake. Whether you believe me or not, that's, as they say, another matter. Yes, I understand. No, you don't understand. How can you understand? You are, as Masha told me, something of a writer. But I am a scientist. Before one can understand, one must have the facts. What are the facts? The facts are, my dear, that Masha bought the divorce from me at a price that no honest woman should pay even if her life depended on it. The telephone rang, but Herman didn't answer it. He counted the rings and went back to the Talmud. He sat at a table which was covered with a holiday cloth, rocking back and forth and intoning, as he used to do in the study house in Tzivkev. And these are the duties the wife performs for her husband. She grinds, bakes, washes, cooks, nurses her child, makes the bed and spins wool. If she has brought one servant, she doesn't grind, bake, or wash. The telephone began to ring again. This time Herman didn't count the rings. He was through with Masha. At night he had taken stock of himself. He was deceiving Masha, and she was deceiving him. They both had the same goal, to get as much pleasure as possible out of life in the few years left before the final darkness. Behind this hedonism festered deception and the principle that might is right. Herman had stayed up all night trying to analyze the modern Jew and his way of life. He had once again arrived at the same conclusion. If a Jew departed so much as one step from the Shulchan Aruch, he found himself spiritually in the sphere of everything base, fascism, Bolshevism, murder, adultery, drunkenness. The telephone rang again. Yedviga came in from the kitchen holding an iron. Why don't you answer the phone? I'll never answer the phone again on a holiday. And if you want to become Jewish, don't iron on Shemini Etzeret. You write on the Sabbath, not I. I won't write on the Sabbath any more. If we don't want to become like the Nazis, we must be Jews. Will you go to Kufoth with me today? Say Hakufoth, not Kufoth. Yes, I'll go with you. You'll have to go to the ritual bath, too, if you want to become a Jewish woman. When will I become Jewish? I'll talk to the rabbi. I'll teach you how to say the prayers. Will we have a child? If God wills it, we'll have one. Yet Vega flushed. She seemed overcome with joy. What shall I do with the iron? Put it away until after the holidays. Yet Vega hesitated, then returned to the kitchen. Herman grasped his chin. He hadn't shaved and his beard had begun to grow. He had decided he could no longer work for the rabbi. He would find a job as a teacher or do something else. He would divorce Tamara. 
he would do what generations of Jews before him had done. True, he had doubts, but even if one were to doubt the existence of oxygen, one would still have to breathe. Since he was suffocating without God in the Torah, he must serve God and study the Torah. The phone rang again. Herman imagined that he could hear Masha's voice in the persistent ringing. At least hear my side. According to the laws of justice, both sides were entitled to be heard. Although Herman knew he was again breaking his vows, he couldn't prevent himself from picking up the receiver. Hello? There was silence at the other end of the line. Apparently, Masha could not speak. Who is it? No one answered. You whore! Herman heard a gasp. Are you still alive? Yes, I'm alive. There was another long silence. What's happened to you? What's happened is that I found out you're a despicable creature. I believe you've gone out of your mind. I cursed the day I met you. Slut! My God! What have I done? Paid for your divorce with prostitution. Masha began to cough. It sounded as if she were choking. Who, who told you this? Leon? Herman didn't reply. He had promised Torchener not to mention his name. He's a vicious devil! He may be vicious, but he spoke the truth. The truth is that he asked me, but I spat in his face. If I'm lying, may I not live to wake up in the morning? Bring us face to face. If he dares to repeat this ugly lie, I'll kill him myself. Oh, Father in heaven, he isn't a Jew, he's a Nazi. Masha wailed so loudly that Herman had to hold the receiver away from his ear. Her voice was like that of a Jewish woman of olden times who had been falsely accused of evil doing. He stood listening to her weeping hysterically. Instead of being moved to pity, his anger was rekindled. You had a lover here in America. If I had a lover in America, may I get cancer. May God hear my words and punish me. If Leon made it up, may the curse fall on him. Father in heaven, see what they're doing to me. If he's telling the truth, may the child in my womb die. Stop it. You're swearing like a fishwife. I don't care. I don't want to live anymore. Masha was convulsed with sobs. All night the snow fell, dry and coarse as salt. On the street where Herman lived, one could barely make out the contours of the few cars buried beneath it. As he looked out the window, Herman imagined that this was the way the Pompeian chariots had looked, covered with ash after the eruption of Vesuvius. Herman had been unable to sleep. He sat in his robe and slippers and stared at the bookcase where the volumes of Gamara once again stood neglected and dusty. The steam radiator whistled its one-note lament, full of inarticulate longing. Bad, bad, bad. Grief, grief, grief. Sick, sick, sick. Herman had been married to Masha by a rabbi, an immigrant, who had agreed to perform the ceremony without a marriage certificate, and she was, by Herman's calculation, in her sixth month. Yet Viga had also missed her period. The rabbi of the synagogue she attended had accepted her ten dollars, a woman had led her to the ritual bath, and now Yadviga was a convert to Judaism. She observed the laws of purification and kept a kosher kitchen. She asked Herman questions continually. Was it permitted to keep meat in the refrigerator when there was a bottle of milk in it? Was she allowed to write to her mother, who, according to Jewish law, was no longer her mother? She asked Herman to speak Yiddish to her, even though she understood little and scolded him for not conducting himself like other Jews. He didn't go to the synagogue, nor did he own a prayer shawl or phylacteries. He would tell her to mind her own business, or do him a favor and leave the Jews alone. They had enough trouble without her. Yadviga no longer kept her neighbors at a distance. These women, with little else to do, instructed her in Judaism, confusing her with conflicting suggestions often based on shtetl superstitions. They showed her how to buy bargains and warned her about being exploited by her husband. An American housewife must have a vacuum cleaner, an electric mixer, a steam iron, and, if possible, a dishwasher. The apartment must be insured against fire and theft. Herman must take out a life insurance policy. In Yadviga's mind, the insurance policies and the dishwasher were both essential aspects of Jewish observance. For the hundredth time, Herman calculated his expenses. He owed rent on both apartments. He had to pay phone bills in the name of Yadviga Prach and Schifferpur Bloch. 
If he didn't pay the utility bills, the gas and electricity would be shut off both here and in the Bronx. He was, as usual, behind in his work for the rabbi. He had promised to phone Tamara at the furnished room into which she had moved, but days had passed and he had yet to call. Well, it's too late to do anything now. Herman went into the bathroom to shave. He had just lathered his face when the phone rang. He went to it, lifted the receiver, and heard the voice of an older woman. This is Shifra Pua. Shifra Pua? What has happened? Masha is sick. The old woman began to sob. The word suicide ran through Herman's mind. Tell me what has happened. Come quickly, please. What is it? Please, come. Shifra Pua hung up. Herman had the impulse to call back, but he knew that it was difficult for Shifra Pua to speak on the phone and that her hearing was poor. He returned to the bathroom. No matter what happened, he had to shave and shower. As long as you're alive, you mustn't stink. When Herman entered Masha's apartment, he saw Shifra Pua and a stocky young man who was a doctor. Shifra Pua was wearing a black kerchief and her face looked more yellow and wrinkled than usual. I thought you would never get here. It's a long ride by subway. Where is she? Herman didn't know if he was asking about a living person or a dead one. She's asleep. Don't go in. The doctor, round-faced, with moist eyes and curly hair, gestured to Herman. The husband? Yes. The doctor turned to Herman. Mr. Broder, who told you your wife was pregnant? She did. Did a doctor examine her? I don't know. I'm not even sure she saw a doctor. The young man shook his head and sighed. Where do you people think you're living? On the moon? In this country, when a woman is pregnant, she's under the continuous care of a doctor. The doctor pointed his index finger to his temple. Her whole pregnancy was here. Shifra Pua had already heard the diagnosis, but clasped her breast as if hearing it for the first time. I don't understand it. She started to scream and go into labor. She had a hemorrhage, but there was no baby. But her belly grew. The child kicked her. All nerves. Such nerves. Father in heaven, defend and protect us from such nerves. But I tell you, she didn't have her period all these months. Well, evil spirits are playing with us. We came out of Gehenna, but Gehenna followed us to America. We ran from Hitler, but he ran after us. Masha was sleeping in Shifra Pua's bed. Herman opened the door quietly and saw her lying there, pale and serene. He gazed at her a long time, overcome with love for her and shame at himself. What could he do? How could he repay her for all the pain he had caused her? When Herman returned to the kitchen, Shifra Pua was looking out the window. Oh, I wanted so much to have a grandchild, at least someone to name after the murdered Jews. Ah, I envy the dead. All day I envy them. I shouldn't have saved myself from the Nazis. I should have stayed with the dying Jews and not run away to America. She picked up a prayer book that was lying on the table, then put it down again. Would you like something to eat? It was snowing again. Yet Viga was in the kitchen making a stew as it used to be made in Sivkev. A song from a Yiddish operetta, which Edviga took to be a religious chant, came from the radio. In the midst of his writing, Herman was overcome with fatigue. He put down his pen, leaned his head against the back of the armchair, and tried to take a little nap. In the Bronx, Masha had not yet returned to work. Her false pregnancy had plunged her into a state of apathy. When Herman spoke to her, she replied in monosyllables, in such a way that they were left with nothing to talk about. Edviga came in from the kitchen. Herman, the stew is finished. So am I, financially, physically, spiritually. Talk so I can understand you. I thought you wanted me to speak to you in Yiddish. The doorbell rang. Herman grimaced. One of your ladies has probably come to give you a lesson. Yadviga went to the door, and Herman crossed out the last page he had written. Well, Rabbi Lampert, the world will have to do with a somewhat shorter sermon. Suddenly there was a suppressed cry, and Yadviga ran back into the room, slamming the door behind her. She stood there trembling, her face white, 
clutching the doorknob as if to prevent someone from forcing his way in. Who is it? Herman rose. Don't go! Don't go! Oh, God! Edviga stood in the doorway as if to block his path. Herman took a step towards her and she grabbed him by the wrist. Spittle appeared on her lips. At that moment the door opened and Herman saw Tamara, in a shabby fur coat, hat, and boots. Stop shaking, idiot! She's alive! Jesus, Maria! Edviga's head jerked convulsively. She pushed herself against Herman, almost knocking him over. Tamara took a step back. I didn't think she'd recognize me. She's alive! She's alive! She isn't dead! Herman began wrestling with Edviga, trying both to calm her and push her away. But she clung to him with primitive strength, bellowing like an animal. She's alive! She's alive! Calm down, foolish peasant! Edviga partially recovered her composure. Oh, holy mother! My heart! She crossed herself. Then, realizing a Jewish woman doesn't make the sign of the cross, folded her arms across her chest. Herman scowled at Tamara. Why did you do this? You could have given her a heart attack. It never occurred to me that she would recognize me. My own mother wouldn't know me. Calm down, Yadzia. I'm not dead and I haven't come to haunt you. Hedviga looked at Tamara and suddenly realized the implication of her words. Oh, God! Oh, God! What will happen to me now? She laid her hand on her belly. And I'm pregnant! Tamara looked surprised but also as if she might burst out laughing. Well, Mazel tov, father. Are you crazy or drunk? Herman had no sooner said the words than he detected the odor of alcohol. Tamara looked around. Don't think I've come here to disturb your bliss. I just wanted to see how you lived. Hmm, you're settled here quite comfortably, I see. When you lived with me, there was always a mess. Your papers and books were everywhere. Here, it's spick and span. She keeps the place clean. You ran around giving speeches. Bonnie Tamara, sit down. You frightened me, and that's the reason I screamed so. God is my witness. If I had known you were alive, I would have stayed away from him. I bear you no grudges, Yadzia. The truth is that I have no claims on him. He didn't know I was struggling to survive somewhere. And he probably always loved you. He surely slept with you before he did with me. No, no. I was an innocent girl. I came to him a virgin. What? Congratulations. Men love virgins. If men had their way, every woman would lie down a prostitute and get up a virgin. He didn't get much of a bargain in him, though. Still, anything is better than being alone. It's a nice apartment, too. We never had such a nice apartment. I'll bring coffee. Would Pani Tamara like something to eat? Tamara didn't answer. Yet Vega went into the kitchen, her slippers clumsily slapping on the floor. Herman noticed that Tamara's hair was must and there were yellowish pouches under her eyes. I didn't know you drank. There's a lot you don't know. You think a person can go through hell and come out unscathed. Well, one can't. In Russia, there was one cure for every illness. Vodka. I thought you were going to the hospital. I'm supposed to go tomorrow, but I'm not sure I want to now. Tamara placed her hand on her hip. This bullet is my best souvenir. It reminds me that I once had a home, parents, children. Come, touched if you like. You're a partner in this. The same revolver may have killed your children. Tamara, I beg you. Tamara, I beg you. Don't be afraid. She won't divorce you. If she does, you can always go to the other one. What's your name again? And if she throws you out too, then you can come to me. Ah, here's Yadzia with the coffee. Yadviga had put on an apron and looked just like the servant she had once been. She sat down the tray with two cups of coffee and a plate of homemade cookies. At that moment, the doorbell rang. Yadviga ran back into the kitchen. Herman went to the door. Who is it? There was muffled talk, but Herman couldn't make out whether the voice was a man's or a woman's. He opened the door. Standing in the hall were a tiny couple. The woman had a sallow, wrinkled face, yellowish eyes, and carrot-colored hair. She wore a house dress and slippers. The man was wearing a felt hat with a feather, a checked jacket that was too light for a cold, wintry day, a pink shirt, striped trousers, tan shoes, and a tie that was a mixture of yellow, red, and green. His eyes twinkled humorously. The woman began to speak in a Polish-accented Yiddish. You don't know me, Mr. Broder, but I know you. We live downstairs. Is your wife home? 
Mrs. Schreier spoke in a Polish-accented Yiddish. This is my friend, Mr. Peschelis. He doesn't live here. He has a house in Seagate. He has. May no evil eye befall him. Houses in New York and Philadelphia, too. He came to visit us, and we told him about you, that you sell books and write, and he would like to talk to you about some business. What business? Not business at all. My business isn't books, but real estate, and I don't do that anymore, either. It's just that I love to read, whether it's a newspaper, a magazine, a book, whatever I can lay my hands on. If you have a few minutes, I'd like to have a chat with you. Nathan Peschelis, a tiny man with a long, narrow head, a hooked nose, pointed chin, and a sunken mouth that had almost no lower lip, smiled with the cocky assurance of a rich man who was paying a visit to the poor. Herman stood in the doorway, blocking his view of Tamara, who was sitting in the kitchen. I I'm terribly sorry, but I'm really very... It won't take long, Mr. Broder. Ten or fifteen minutes. Mr. Peschelis only comes to see me once every six months. Sometimes not that often. He is. May no evil eye befall him, a rich man. If you're ever looking for an apartment, you may be able to do you a favor. What kind of favors? What kind of favors? I don't do any favors. I have to pay rent myself. This is America. But if you need an apartment, I can recommend you, and it won't do you any harm. Herman hesitated. Well, come in. Forgive me for receiving you in the kitchen, and my wife is uh, indisposed. Tamara rose. I'd better go now. Nathan Peschelis looked at her curiously. Don't run away. You're a pretty woman, but I'm not a bear, and I don't swallow people. Herman urged Tamara to stay. She resumed her seat. I see there aren't enough chairs. Uh, one second. Herman went into the living room. Jadwiga stood there, staring at the door apprehensively. Who is it? Mrs. Schreier. She brought a man with her. What does she want? I can't see anyone now. Oh, I'm going out of my mind. When Herman returned with the chair, the trio was already seated around the kitchen table, and Mr. Peschelis was talking to Tamara. Only a few weeks? But you're not like a greenhorn at all. In my day, you could spot an immigrant from a mile away. You look like an American. Absolutely. Herman closed the door behind him. Uh, Jadwiga doesn't feel well. I don't think she'll join us. I'm sorry, it's not very comfortable in here. Mrs. Schreier snorted. Comfortable? Hitler taught us to get along without comfort. Herman looked at her. You come from there, too? Yes, from there. From the concentration camps? From Russia. Tamara perked up. Where were you in Russia? In Jambul. I lived on Nabrozhnaya Street. God in heaven, I also lived on the Nabrozhnaya, with a Rabbitson from Zikov and her son. Mr. Peschlis clapped his well-manicured hands together. Well, it's a small world, a small world. You know what? He turned to Mrs. Schreier. Let's all go down to your place. I'll send out for bagels, locks, and maybe even some cognac. Since both of you are from Jambul, you'll have a lot to talk about. I bring your wife, Mr. Uh, uh, Broder. I remember people, but I forget names. Nowadays, a Gentile converting to Judaism is no small matter. I hear she hid you in a loft. Herman was about to make an excuse when the phone rang. He became angry at Marsha. Why was she calling? She knew he was coming. He went to the small foyer that adjoined the kitchen and lifted the receiver. Hello? Is this Herman Broder? Yes. This is Rabbi Lampert. Suddenly it was quiet. In the kitchen they had stopped talking. Uh, yes, Rabbi? So you do have a telephone, and not in the Bronx, but in Brooklyn. Esplanade, too, is somewhere in Coney Island. My friend moved. He moved and had a phone installed. Yeah, sure. I'm a damn fool, but not such a damn fool as you think. Your whole comedy is superfluous. I know everything, absolutely everything. You got married and didn't even tell me, so I could congratulate you. Who knows, I might even have bought you a nice wedding present. But if this is the way you want it, it's your privilege. I'm calling because in your Kabbalah article you made several serious errors that do neither of us any credit. What errors? I can't tell you over the phone. Why are you talking so quietly? Do you have a sore throat or something? No, no. I told you all along I can't work with a man who won't give me his address and phone number. I must see you right away, so tell me where you live. If we make the corrections, they'll hold the presses until tomorrow. I don't live here, but in the Bronx. Again in the Bronx? Where in the Bronx? Honestly, I can't figure you out. I'll explain everything to you. I'm just here temporarily. Temporarily? What's the matter with you? Or do you have two wives? Maybe. Well, when will you be in the Bronx? Tonight. Give me the address. And once and for all, let there be an end to this muddle. Herman came into the kitchen and saw Jadwiga, who had come out of the living room. 
Her face and eyes were still red, and she stood with her hands on her hips, looking over to where he had just been standing. She had apparently been listening to his conversation. Mr. Peschlis came over, rubbing his hands together. Well, uh, Mr. Uh, Broda, I met your lovely wife. Uh, now come down to Mrs. Schreier's, and we'll all become friends. I'm afraid I must leave now. Tamara rose. I have to go, too. Yadviga snapped out of her reverie. Where is Pony Tamara going? Please, stay here. I'll make supper. No, Yadzia, another time. Well, Mrs. Shroya, it looks as if they're not going to accept our invitation. Come, we didn't succeed this time. Peshla stopped at the door and turned to Tamara. I didn't even learn your name. Tamara. Miss, Mrs.? Whatever you like. Tamara what? Surely you have a last name. Tamara looked questioningly at Herman, at Yadviga. Tamara Broder. Also Broder? Are you brother and sister? Herman answered for her. Cousins. Well, it's a small world. Extraordinary times. I read a story in the papers about a refugee who was eating supper with his new wife. Suddenly the door opened and in walked his former wife, who he thought had died in the ghetto. That's the kind of mess Hitler and Stalin and the rest of the gangs cooked up. He put his hand in his pocket and handed Tamara two calling cards. Well, whoever you are, let's not be strangers. No sooner did the guests leave than Yadviga burst into tears. Where are you going now? Why are you leaving me? Pani Tamara, he doesn't sell books. It's a lie. He has a mistress and he goes to her. Everyone knows it. The neighbors laugh at me. And I saved his life. I took the last bite of food from my mouth and brought it to him in the hayloft. I carried out his excrement. Please, Yadviga, stop. She telephones every day, his sweetheart. He thinks I don't understand. He spends days with her and he comes home penniless and exhausted. The old landlady comes every day and threatens to throw us out in the middle of winter. Yadzia, I have to go. Yadviga ran to the door and spread her arms out, barring it. I won't let you go, Pani Tamara. If he wants to go back to you, I'll give the baby away. Here, you can give children away. They even pay. Stop talking nonsense, Yadzia. I won't go back to him and you needn't give the baby away. Herman had put on his coat. Yadzia, let me out. You're not going. Yadzia, a rabbi's waiting for me. I work for him. If I don't go now, we'll remain without a crust of bread. It's a lie. A whore is waiting for you, not a rabbi. Well, I see what's going on here. Tamara went over to Yadviga and kissed her. Yadviga laid her head on Tamara's shoulder and cried loudly. She kissed Tamara on the cheeks, forehead, and both hands. She almost sank to her knees, mumbling incomprehensibly in her peasant dialect. Tamara had to virtually tear herself away. Herman waited until he could no longer hear Tamara's footsteps. Then he grabbed Yadviga by the wrists and wrestled with her in silence. He pushed her and she fell to the floor with a thud. As he hurried down the rickety stairs, two at a time, he heard a sound that was both a cry and a groan. He remembered something he had once learned. When you break one of the Ten Commandments, you break them all. I'll end up a murderer. The rabbi's Cadillac practically filled the snow-covered street. All the lights in Shifra Pua's house had been turned on and the car seemed to glow in the dark. As Herman mounted the stairs, it suddenly occurred to him that the rabbi might not have found any mistakes in his article at all. His call might simply have been an excuse to interfere in Herman's affairs. The first thing Herman noticed when he entered the apartment was a bouquet of roses and a vase on the dresser. On the cloth-covered table between the cookies and oranges stood a magnum of champagne. The rabbi and Masha were clicking their glasses together. She had put on her party dress and was already tipsy. Seeing Herman, the rabbi rose and reached him in one long stride. Mazel tov, bridegroom! The snow was falling for the second day. There was no heat in Shifapua's apartment. The furnace had broken down and the janitor lay in a drunken stupor in his basement apartment. Shifapua wandered about the house in heavy boots, huddled in a ragged fur coat which she had brought from Germany, her glasses perched on the end of her nose, a prayer book in her hand. She paced up and down, alternately praying and cursing the swindling landlords who allowed poor tenants to freeze in winter. Mama, you should be ashamed of yourself. In Stutthof, if you had what you have now, you would have gone out of your mind with joy. We'll move out of here. Just wait till spring. 
I won't last till spring. Old witch, you won't live us all. Masha's voice was shrill with impatience. The party to which the rabbi had invited her and Herman had driven her into a frenzy. At first she had refused to go, arguing that Leon Torchner was probably behind the invitation. Then, abruptly, she had changed her mind. Why should she be afraid of Leon Torchner? They had been legally divorced. If he greeted her, she would simply turn her back. If he tried any of his tricks, she would spit in his face. Herman observed once again how Masha went from one extreme to the other. Now that she had decided to go to the party, her enthusiasm knew no bounds. She flung open closets, dresser drawers, dragged out dresses, blouses, shoes, heaps of stockings, lingerie. She smoked cigarette after cigarette, and every few minutes she took a swig from a bottle of cognac. Shifra Pua, who deprecated the idea of the party, mumbled about Jews not having the right to celebrate after the Holocaust, but inspected her daughter's appearance and suggested improvements. She insisted that Masha wear a sweater and a pair of warm underpants, but Masha wouldn't hear of it. When Herman and Masha stepped into the street, a wild wind was blowing from the Hudson. Masha's party dress fluttered and filled like a balloon. She clung to Herman, one hand holding on to her hat, the other holding down the hem of her dress. Herman had to lean into the wind with all his might in order not to be blown back. Masha, gasping, shouted something to him, but the wind carried her words away. Herman's hat tried to tear itself from his head. His coattails and trousers whipped about his legs. Snow covered his eyelids. It was a miracle that they were able to make out the rabbi's house. The lobby was warm and tranquil. Masha stood before a mirror trying to repair some of the damage inflicted on her dress and appearance. She twisted a lock of hair into place and frowned. If I can survive this, I'll never die. In yesterday's episode of Isaac Singer's Enemies, A Love Story, Herman Broder learned that Rabbi Lampert was aware of his marriage to Masha. Before that, Yadviga discovered that Herman's first wife, Tamara, was still alive. And Tamara, of course, had known about both of her rivals for some time. So the only wife with whom he is still on relatively good terms is Masha. When we left the happy couple, they had just arrived at Rabbi Lampert's where a party is in progress. Gold-framed pictures hung on the walls of the lobby. Carpets covered the floor, chandeliers diffused soft light. Sofas and easy chairs awaited guests. Herman stood before a full-length mirror. It reflected all the defects of his figure and attire. His back was stooped and he looked haggard. He had lost weight. His overcoat and suit seemed too big for him. The elevator arrived, but the operator hesitated an instant before opening the doors. When he stopped at the rabbi's floor, he watched suspiciously as Herman rung the bell. No one came. Herman could hear noise, the sound of talking, the rabbi's loud voice within the apartment. Finally, a black maid in a white apron and a white cap opened the door. Behind her was the rabbi's wife, the Rebbitson. She was a tall, statuesque woman with wavy blonde hair, a turned-up nose, and wore a long, gold-colored dress. She was bedecked with jewelry. Everything about this woman appeared bony, pointed, long, Gentile. Suddenly the rabbi appeared. Here they are! He stretched out both hands, one to Herman and one to Masha, at the same time kissing her. She's a real beauty. She's not the prettiest woman in America. Eileen, look at her. Give me your coats. It's cold, isn't it? I was afraid you might not be able to make it. My husband has told me so much about you. I'm really happy that... Before his wife could complete the sentence, the rabbi put his arms around Herman and Masha and led them into the living room. He pushed his way through the crowd, introducing them as he went along. Herman had never been to an American party. He had anticipated that the guests would be seated and that a meal would be served. But there was neither room to sit, nor was a meal in evidence. Through the smoky haze he saw clean-shaven men with tiny skullcaps perched on top of their heads, as well as men without skullcaps, and men with goatees or with full beards. There was as much variety in the women's hair coloring as in the shades of their dresses. He heard English, Hebrew, German, even French. There was a smell of perfume, liquor, and chopped liver. The rabbi led Masha to the bar, leaving Herman behind. A butler approached and asked him what he wanted to drink. A maid offered him a tray of assorted cold cuts, eggs, crackers. He tried to spear half an egg with a toothpick, but it slipped away. He wished he could sit down somewhere, but he didn't see an empty chair. 
People were speaking so loudly he was deafened by the noise. Someone spoke to him in English, but in the din he couldn't make out the words. A woman shrieked with laughter. What on earth had happened to Masha? She seemed to have been swallowed up in the throng. Herman walked down the hall to a room with several armchairs and couches. The walls were lined with books from floor to ceiling. Some men and women were sitting around with drinks in their hands. A vacant chair stood in the corner, and Herman sank into it. The group was discussing a professor who had received a $5,000 grant to write a book. They were ridiculing him and his writing. Herman heard the names of universities, foundations, scholarships, grants, publications on Judaica, socialism, history, psychology... What kind of women are these? How is it they are so well informed? Herman was self-conscious about his shabby clothing and apprehensive lest they try to draw him into their conversation. He angled his chair still further away from the group and took a copy of Plato's dialogues from the bookcase. He opened it at random at Fido. It may seem unlikely that those who are sincerely concerned with philosophy actually are merely studying how to die and how to be dead. A servant came to the door and announced something that Herman didn't understand. Everyone got up and left the room. Alone, Herman began to fantasize. He imagined that the Nazis were in New York, but someone, perhaps even the rabbi, had boarded him up in this library. A person who looked familiar appeared in the doorway. A small man wearing a dinner jacket, his laughing eyes expressed recognition and irony. He addressed Herman in Yiddish. Who do I see? Well, it's really as they say, a small world... Herman stood up in confusion. You don't recognize me? I'm so confused here that... Pescheles! Nathan Pescheles! I came to your apartment a few weeks ago. Oh, yes, of course. Why are you sitting here by yourself? Did you come here to read books? I didn't know you knew Rabbi Lampert, but who doesn't know him? Why don't you get something to eat? They're serving food in the other room. Where's your wife? She's here somewhere. I've lost her. As soon as Herman uttered these words... He realized that Peschlis was talking not about Masha, but about Yadviga. Come, let's find it together. My wife couldn't come tonight. She has the flu. There are some women who get sick whenever they have to go anywhere. Peschlis led Herman to the living room. The crowd was standing with plates in hand, eating and chatting. Some sat on window sills, on the radiator, wherever they could find a spot. Herman caught sight of Masha. She was with a short man who held her by the arm. He was obviously saying something very amusing because Masha laughed out loud and clapped her hands together. When she saw Herman, she squirmed out of the man's grip and made her way to his side. Here's my long-lost husband. Masha threw her arms about Herman's neck and kissed him as if he had just returned from a journey. Her face was flushed and her eyes shone with high spirits. Her breath reeked of alcohol. Herman, this is Yasha Kotick. She turned to the companion who had followed her across the room. The man was wearing a European tuxedo with worn lapels and a wide satin stripe on each side of his trousers. His glossy black hair and youthful figure contrasted oddly with his wrinkled forehead and lined mouth, which revealed a set of false teeth. He smiled and raised one eyebrow mockingly. So this is your husband? Herman, Yashakotik is the actor I told you about. We were together in the camp. I didn't know he was in New York. Someone told me that you was in Palestine. I thought she was somewhere near the Wailing Wall or at Rachel's tomb. I look around. She's standing and drinking whiskey in Rabbi Lampert's living room. That's America for you. Crazy Columbus, ha! Huh? Simulating a gun with his thumb and index finger, Kotek made a shooting gesture. Herman had heard a great deal about him from Masha. It was said that he had told jokes while digging his own grave, and that the Nazis had been so amused by him that they had let him go. Similarly, his buffoonery had stood him in good stead with the Bolsheviks. He'd been able to overcome countless perils with his gallows humor and comic antics. Masha had boasted to Herman that Yasha had been in love with her, but she had discouraged him. How did you catch her? I've been searching for her through half the world, and you marry her just like that. Who gave you the right? It's you should pardon me, rank imperialism. He turned to Masha, raising one eye in mock surprise, while the other drooped as if crying. What did you see in him that made you marry him? What, for example, does he have that I don't? He's a serious person. And you're a pain in the neck. Kotick turned to Herman, underscoring his question with an exaggerated raising of his shoulder. Do you know what you have here? She's not just a woman, she's a firebrand. Whether from heaven or hell, I can't decide. Her wit kept us all alive. She could have convinced Stalin himself if he had paid a visit to the camp. He turned to Masha. 
Whatever happened to Moshe Pfeiffer? I thought you went away with him. With him? What are you jabbering about? Are you drunk or are you just trying to make trouble? I don't know a thing about Moshe Pfeiffer, nor do I want to. He had a wife and everyone knew it. If they're both alive, they're surely together. Well, I didn't say a thing. You don't have to be jealous, Mr. Uh, uh, what's your name? Broder. During the war, none of us was human. The Nazis made soap out of us. Kosher soap. And to the Bolsheviks, we were just manure for the revolution. What can you expect from manure? If it were up to me, uh, I would wipe those years from the calendar. Suddenly, Herman remembered Mr. Peschlis, who had been standing behind the group, with a smile frozen on his lipless mouth, waiting with the patience of a poker player who knows he has an ace in the hole. Uh, Masha, this is Mr. Peschelis. Peschelis? Seems to me I once met a Peschelis. In Russia or Poland, uh, I don't remember where now. I come from a small family. We probably had a grandmother named Pesha or Peschela. I met Mr. Broder in Brooklyn, in Coney Island. Masha looked quizzically at Herman. Yasha Kotick scratched his head roguishly. Coney Island? I played there once. Or tried to. What's it called? Oh, yes, Brighton. A whole theater full of old women. Where did they get so many old women in America? They're not only deaf, they've forgotten Yiddish. How can you perform to an audience that can't hear your jokes and couldn't understand them if they did? The manager, or whatever he called himself, kept bending my ear about success. Go be a success in an old folks' home. And what do you do, Mr. Peschelis? Are you in business? What's the difference? I don't take anything from you. Take? Peschelis looked at Masha slyly. How long have you two been married? Masha frowned. Long enough to start thinking about a divorce. Where do you live? Also in Coney Island. What's all this talk about Coney Island? What happened at Coney Island? Herman's stomach tightened. Well, here it is, he thought. It surprised him that the anticipation of the catastrophe had been much worse than the actuality. Yasha closed one eye and wiggled his nose. Peschless took a step closer. I'm not making it up, Mrs. Uh, what shall I call you? I was in Mr. Broder's home in Coney Island. What street is it on? I'm between Mermaid and Neptune. I thought the woman who was converted was his wife. It turns out he has a pretty little wife here. I tell you, these greenhorns know how to live. He turned to Herman with a leer. What happened to that other pretty little woman? Tamara, Tamara Broder. Marshall looked at Herman strangely. Who is this Tamara? Wasn't your dead wife called Tamara? My dead wife is in America. As Herman spoke, his knees trembled and he felt sick to his stomach. Marsha's face reddened angrily. Has your wife risen from the dead? So it seems. Is that the one you went to see at her uncle's on East Broadway? Yes. You told me she was old and ugly. Yasha Kotick stuck out his tongue and rolled his eyes. That's what all men tell all wives. Peschelis stroked his chin. I'm not sure now who's mixed up, I or everyone else. I visited Mrs. Schreier in Coney Island, and she told me about a woman who had converted to Judaism, and that you were her husband. She described you as an author, a rabbi, or whatever you are, and said you sold books. I have a weakness for literary matters, so I thought I might buy something from you. Now, who is Tamara? Fiery rings appeared before Herman's eyes. They oscillated slowly in his line of vision. It was a phenomenon he had experienced ever since childhood. It was as if little rings lurked behind his eyes, ready to appear at times of stress. I don't know, Mr. Peschelis, what you want or why you're interfering in other people's business. If you think there's something wrong, why don't you call the police? What police? What are you talking about? I'm not, as they say, God's Cossack. As far as I'm concerned, you can have a whole harem. It's just that a few days after I saw you in Coney Island, I was visiting someone in the hospital, a daughter of an old friend. I come in and see your Tamara. They were sharing a room. She had just had a bullet removed from her hip or something. She told me she was your wife. Perhaps she was talking in a state of delirium. Herman opened his mouth to answer, but just then the rabbi joined them. I've been looking all over for them, and here they are. You all know each other. My friend Nathan Peschler knows everyone, and everyone knows him. Marsha, you're the most beautiful woman at the party. I never knew there was such lovely woman left in Europe. Ah, oh, and here's Yasha Kotick, too. The comedian raised an eyebrow. I knew Marsha before you did. Well, my friend Herman hid her from me. Peschless smiled insinuatingly. He's hiding more than one. You think so? You must know him better than I do. To me, he was always a eunuch. I wish I was such a eunuch. The rabbi laughed. Huh, you can't hide from Mr. Peschless. He has his spies everywhere. What do you know? Let me in on it. 
Excuse me, Rabbi. I'll be right back. Herman walked away quickly, and Masha hurried after him. They had to push their way through the crowd. Don't follow me. I'll be right back. Masha grabbed Herman by the sleeve. Who is this Peshalus? Who is Tamara? I beg you, let go of me. Give me a straight answer. I have to vomit. Herman stood up, feeling drained. Someone banged on the door and tried to push it open. He had soiled the floor tiles, splattered the wall, and had to clean up. He looked in the mirror which reflected his pale face. He removed a hand towel from the rack and wiped off his jacket lapels. He tried to open the window to let the smell out, but didn't have the strength. He made one last effort and the window opened. Hardened snow and icicles hung from the frame. Herman breathed in deeply and the fresh air revived him. Again he heard the door being pounded on, the knob rattling. He opened it and saw Masha. Are you trying to break the door? Shall I call a doctor? No, doctor. We have to get out of here. You're all dirty. Masha took a handkerchief from her purse and began to wipe him off. How many wives do you have? Three. Ten. May God shame you as you've shamed me. I'm going home. Go ahead, but to your peasant, not to me. Everything is over between us. Over is over. Masha returned to the living room, and Herman went in search of his coat. He didn't know where to look. The rabbi's wife, who had taken it from him, had disappeared. He wandered among the crowd in the foyer. He asked the man where the coats were, but the man just shrugged his shoulders. Herman went into the library and dropped into an armchair. Someone had left a half a glass of whiskey and part of a sandwich on an end table. Herman ate the bread and smelly cheese and drank the remains of the whiskey. The room spun round him like a carousel. Everything seemed to shimmer, quiver, change form. People stuck their heads in the door, but Herman didn't really see them. Their faces swam around, indistinctly. Someone spoke to him, but his ears felt as if they were full of water. Then he recognized Masha. She was standing there with a drink in her hand. She pulled up a chair and sat down, almost touching his knee with hers. Who is Tamara? My wife is alive. She's in America. We're through, but I think you owe it to me to be honest with me for this one last time. It's the truth. Who is Peshalus? I don't know. Rabbi Lampert has offered me a job. Supervisor in a convalescent home. The pay is $75 a week. What will happen to your mother? There will be a place for her there, too. Herman knew what this meant. No one would offer an inexperienced woman a salary of $75 a week unless he had an ulterior motive. But it no longer mattered. Herman seemed to be experiencing the disintegration of the limbs, the Hasidic description for the mystical state of selflessness. He leaned his head against the back of the chair. His one desire was to lie down somewhere. He heard talking, laughing, footsteps, the clatter of dishes and glassware. Gradually... The fuzziness in his brain diminished. The room stopped spinning. He opened his eyes. Nathan Peshalus stood before him. Oh, so here you are. They're looking for you. Who? The rabbi, the rabbitson. Your marshal's a pretty woman. Piquant. Where do you find them? No offense, but to me you look like a nothing. Herman didn't answer. How do you do it? I'd like to know your secret. Mr. Peshalus, you needn't envy me. Why not? In Brooklyn, a Gentile has herself converted for your sake. Here you have a woman pretty as a picture, and Tamara is nothing to sneeze at either. Perhaps you know where I can find my coat. I want to leave, but I can't find it. Is that so? All these women you could find in your coat you can't find? Well, I'd better see what's doing out there. Left alone, Herman sat with his head bowed. He noticed a copy of the Bible on a shelf. He picked it up and leafed through the pages and found psalms. Be gracious unto me, O Lord, for I am in distress. Mine eye wasteth away with vexation, yea, in my soul and my body. For my life is spent in sorrow and my years in sighing. My strength faileth because of my iniquity and my bones are wasting away. Because of mine adversaries I am become a reproach. 
yea, unto my neighbors exceedingly, and a dread to my acquaintances. Herman wondered how it was that these words fitted all circumstances, all ages, all moods, while secular literature, no matter how well written, in time lost its pertinence. What are you doing? Reading the Bible? You lousy hypocrite! Herman looked up and saw Masha standing there unsteadily. She carried a plate and a glass of whiskey. Her face was pale, but her eyes shone with derision. She was obviously drunk. Who is Tamara? Tell me, once and for all. I told you, my wife is alive. Is that the truth, or are you still leading me on? It's the truth. But they shot her. She's alive. The children, too? No, not the children. Well, there's a hell that's too much even for Masha. This may be the last time I talk to you, but I want you to know that you're the worst fraud I've ever known in my life. And believe me, I've known plenty of rats. Where is your resurrected wife? She lives in a furnished room. Give me her address and phone number. What for? All right, I'll give it to you. But I don't have my address book with me. Masha shook her head in disgust. If you hear I'm dead, don't come to my funeral. When Herman got outside, it was one o'clock in the morning. A biting wind blew from the Hudson, and the cold penetrated his body in a few seconds. He hadn't the strength to make the long trip to Coney Island. If only he had money for a hotel room. But he had less than three dollars in his pocket. Should he go back and borrow some money from the rabbi? No, I'd rather die. Herman stumbled into the cafeteria, breathless and stiff with cold. Here, in the light and warmth, breakfast was already being served. The smell of food made him feel faint. Herman ordered oatmeal, eggs, a roll, and coffee at the counter. The whole meal came to fifty-five cents. As he carried the tray back to his table, his legs trembled under the weight. But as soon as he began to eat, his vitality returned. The aroma of the coffee was intoxicating. He now only had one wish, that the cafeteria remained open all night. It took Tamara several minutes to come to the phone. The woman who had answered had to go upstairs to call her. I hope I didn't wake you. It's me, Herman. Yes, Herman? Were you asleep? No, I was reading the newspaper. Tamara, I'm in a cafeteria on Broadway. They close at two o'clock. I have nowhere to go. Tamara hesitated a moment. Where are your wives? They're both not speaking to me. What are you doing on Broadway at this hour? I was at a party at the rabbi's. I see. Would you like to come here? Tamara, I'm ashamed to be bothering you like this. It's just that I have no place to sleep and I don't have the money for a hotel. Ah, oh, I've gotten myself into such a mess that everything is hopeless. I'd better go back to Coney Island. At this hour? It will take you all night. No, Herman. Come to my place. I can't sleep. I'm up all night anyhow. Herman got off the train at 18th Street and walked the block to Tamara's house. As he ascended the slippery steps to the glass door of her apartment block, he saw her in the dim light of a single electric bulb. She was waiting for him in an overcoat, the bottom of her nightgown showing below the hem, her face gray with sleeplessness, her hair uncombed. She opened the door silently, and they shuffled up the stairs. Have you been waiting long? What's the difference? I'm used to waiting. Herman had slept an hour and had awakened. He lay in bed, wearing his trousers, jacket, shirt, and socks. Tamara had thrown her mangy fur coat and Herman's overcoat over the top of the blanket. She was saying... This is more or less the way we had to struggle in Jamboul. You won't believe me, Herman, but I take some comfort in it. I don't want to forget what we went through. When it's warm in the room, I imagine that I've betrayed all the Jews in Europe. You said on the phone that you had been planning to call me. What about? Tamara was thoughtful. Oh, I don't know how to begin. Herman, it isn't in me to lie continually the way you do. 
My aunt and uncle confronted me about us. Since I had already confessed the truth to a nobody like Pashalis, how could I keep the facts from my only relatives I have left in the world? I thought my uncle would die of shock when I told him you were married to a Gentile. Naturally, he wants us to get a divorce. He has in mind not one but ten matches for me. Learned men, fine Jews, all refugees who have lost their wives in Europe. But I have as much desire to get married as to dance on the roof. My mother, blessed be her memory, once told me a story about dead people who don't know they've died. They eat, drink, even get married. So, since we once lived together, had children together, and are now roaming around the world of delusion, why do we need a divorce? Tamara, they can put a zombie in prison, too. No one is going to imprison you. Why are you so afraid of prison? Who will inform on you? Your mistress? Maybe Pashalus? Why should he inform on you? And what proof does he have? My advice is to go back with Yadviga and make peace with her. Is that what you wanted to tell me? I can't work for the rabbi any more. It's out of the question now. I owe rent. I hardly have enough money to get through tomorrow. Herman, I want to say something, but don't be angry with me. What is it? Herman, people like you are incapable of making decisions for themselves. It's true I'm not very good at it either, but sometimes it's easier to deal with others' problems than with one's own. Here in America, some people have what is called a manager. Let me be your manager. Put yourself entirely in my hands. I'll tell you what to do, and you do it. I'll find you a job, too. How? That's not your concern. I'll do something. Beginning tomorrow, I'll take care of all your needs, and you must be ready to do whatever I ask. If I tell you to go out and dig ditches, you must go out and dig ditches. And if they put me in jail, then I'll send you packages in jail. Really, Tamara, this is just a way of giving me your few dollars. No, Herman, you won't be taking anything away from me. I know I'm just a greenhorn, but I'm used to living in strange places. Starting tomorrow, I'm taking over all your affairs. I can see that things have become too much for you, and you're about to fall under the burden. Herman was silent for a long time. Are you an angel? Maybe. Who knows what angels are? Ah, I knew it was madness to phone you so late at night. But something made me do it. Yes, I'll put myself in your hands. I have no strength left. Good. Now get undressed. You're ruining your suit. When Herman woke up, Tamara was already dressed. She looked at him appraisingly, and her face took on a decisive expression. Do you remember our agreement? Go, wash up. Here's a towel. Tamara took Herman to a cafeteria on 23rd Street. She didn't even ask what he wanted to order. She sat him at a table and brought him orange juice, a roll, an omelet, and coffee. She watched him eat for a moment, then went to get breakfast for herself. Herman held his coffee in both hands, not drinking, but warming himself with it. His head bent lower and lower. Women had ruined him, but they had also shown him compassion. He consoled himself. I'll manage to live without Masha, too. Tamara is right. We're not really alive anymore. In yesterday's episode of Isaac Singer's Enemies, A Love Story, Herman Broder had finally been caught in his own web of marital intrigue. While attending a party at Rabbi Lampert's, our much-married hero ran into a chance acquaintance who exposed Herman's triple life to the incredulous rabbi and an outraged Masha. With the wish that God should shame him the way he has shamed her, Masha sent Herman packing into the winter night. With four dollars in his pocket and no one else to turn to, Herman telephoned Tamara, who turned out to be an angel of mercy. Not only did she let her wayward husband spend the night in her furnished room, but offered to become his personal manager. As he was obviously incapable of making his own decisions, she would make them for him. From now on, she would take care of all his needs. All he had to do was follow orders. It was another offer which Herman couldn't refuse. 
Winter was over. Yadviga was walking around with a pointed belly. Tamara had reserved a bed for her in a clinic and talked to her every day on the phone in Polish. Wojtas sang and warbled from early morning to evening. Mariana had laid a little egg. In New Jersey, Masha and Shifrapua celebrated the Passover Seder with the aged and infirm in the rabbi's convalescent home. Tamara had helped Yadviga prepare for the holiday. The neighbors, who were told that she was Herman's cousin, had something new to wag their tongues about. But if a man chooses to be an outcast and has found a woman who will tolerate his ways, there was nothing to be done about it. Herman could barely believe it, but Tamara had found him a job. Rabbi Abraham Nissen Yaroslaver and his wife Shiva Hadas had decided to go on a long visit to Israel. Rabbi Abraham Nissen even hinted that he might settle there permanently. Tamara had talked her uncle into leaving the store in her hands. Herman would help her run it. Tamara would live in her uncle's apartment and pay the rent. Since Masha had accepted the job at the convalescent home, Herman no longer felt that he was in control of things, nor did he want to be. He had become a fatalist in practice as well as theory. He was willing to let the powers lead him, whether they were called chance or providence or Tamara. His only problem was this matter of hallucinations. In the subway he would see Masha in a train going the opposite way. The telephone in the store would ring and he would hear her voice. It would be several seconds before he realized that it was not she. The most frequent callers were young Americans, asking whether they could sell or give away books left to them by fathers who had died. How they knew about Rabbi Abraham Nissen's bookstore was a mystery. The old man had never advertised anywhere. It was all one great riddle to Herman. Rabbi Abraham Nissen's trust in him, Tamara's readiness to help him, her devotion to Yadviga. Since that night in the Catskills, Tamara would have nothing to do with him physically. Their relationship was entirely impersonal. A latent business sense had awakened in her. With Herman's help, she catalogued the books, set prices, and sent torn books out to the bindery to be repaired. Before Passover, she had stocked up on Haggadahs, Seder trays, matzah covers, skullcaps of all styles and colors, even candles and matzah plates. How strange it was to be sitting at the Seder table with Tamara and Yadviga and to be reciting the Haggadah with the two of them. They had insisted that Herman wear a skullcap and go through the entire ceremony. Tamara asked the four questions. For him, and probably for her too, it was all a game, an exercise in nostalgia. But then what wasn't a game? Nowhere could he find anything that was real, not even in the so-called exact sciences. Herman read the Haggadah and yawned. He raised his wine glass and poured off the ten drops to indicate the ten plagues visited on Pharaoh. Tamara praised Jedviga's dumplings. A fish from the Hudson River or some lake had paid with its life so that Herman, Tamara, and Jedviga should be reminded of the miracle of the exodus from Egypt. A chicken had donated its neck to the Passover sacrifice. Both Jedviga and Herman begged Tamara to stay overnight, but she insisted on going home. She wished them both a happy holiday and departed. Herman went into his bedroom and lay down. He didn't want to think about Masha, but his thoughts kept returning to her. The telephone rang. Herman almost tripped as he ran to pick it up. He was afraid that she might change her mind and hang up. He shouted a breathless hello into the receiver. There was no answer. Hello? 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 Still no answer. You left, not I. No one replied. Herman waited a moment. You can't make me any more miserable than I am. And he hung up. Weeks went by. Herman had fallen asleep and was dreaming about Masha when the telephone rang. He threw off his blankets and bolted out of bed. Jadwiga continued to snore. He ran into the hall, bruising his knee in the dark, and lifted the receiver. Hello? There was no answer. If you don't answer, I'm going to hang up. Wait! It was Masha's voice. It sounded choked, and she was swallowing her words. After a time, her speech became clear. I'm in Coney Island. What are you doing in Coney Island? There was a long silence. 
I've come back to you. Herman hung up quietly and remained standing by the phone. He listened attentively. Yet Vega was still snoring. He stood there in the dark with the mute submissiveness of one who has surrendered his will. He hadn't realized how intensely he had longed for Masha. But he had to talk to Tamara. He remembered he had a flashlight in a drawer, found it, and dialed Rabbi Abraham Nissen's number. The phone rang for minutes before he heard Tamara's sleepy voice. Tamara, forgive me. This is Herman. Yes, Herman. What's the matter? I'm leaving yet, Viga. I'm going away with Masha. Tamara did not speak for a time. Do you know what you're doing? I know, and I'm doing it. A woman who demands such sacrifices doesn't deserve them. I didn't think you'd lost your grip on yourself so completely. These are the facts. What about the store? It's all in your hands. The rabbi for whom I used to work wants to take care of Yadvika's hospital bills. I'll give you his address and phone number. Wait, I'll get a pencil. When Tamara returned, Herman gave her the information. There was an awkward silence. Couldn't you at least wait until she had the baby? I can't wait. Herman, you have the keys to the store. Can you open up in the morning? I'll be there at ten o'clock. I'll be there. The taxi stopped at the Manhattan Beach Hotel. It was quiet in the lobby. The clerk was dozing behind the counter in front of the key boxes. Herman was sure that the elevator man would ask him where he was going at that hour. But he took him to the floor for which he asked, without a word. Herman had no difficulty finding the room. He knocked at the door, and Masha opened it immediately. She was wearing a negligee and slippers. The only illumination came from the street lights. They fell into each other's arms and clutched each other wordlessly, locked together in grim silence. The sun rose, and Herman hardly noticed it. Masha tore herself away from him and went to lower the shade. Herman slept deeply and awoke with renewed desire and a fear that was the residue of a forgotten dream. He woke Masha to explain that he had to be in the bookstore by ten o'clock. She rose with manic energy, discussing their plans as she washed and dressed. But once in the subway, she became silent. She sat with her eyes shut. Her face, which that morning had looked so full and youthful, had again become drawn. Herman was supposed to have met Tamara at ten o'clock, but it was close to eleven by the time he arrived at the store. Tamara was nowhere in sight. Herman unlocked the door and went to call her. There was no answer. He thought Masha must have reached home by this time. He dialed her number and the phone rang, but no one answered. He dialed again, and again the phone rang many times. He was about to hang up when he heard Masha's voice. I've been robbed! They've taken all our things! They've left nothing but the bare walls! She was both shouting and crying. He could barely make out what she was saying. When did it happen? Who knows? Oh, God, why was I cremated like the other Jews? She let out a wail and burst into hysterical crying. Have you called the police? What can the police do? They're thieves themselves! Masha hung up. It seemed to Herman that he could still hear her crying. The door opened and Tamara entered the store. She was wearing a dress that seemed several sizes too large for her. She looked pale and haggard. Where were you? I waited from ten to half past. We had a customer. He wanted to buy an entire set of the Mishnah. Tamara, I'm no longer in my own hands. Well, you're digging your own grave. You always talked about free choice. I read that book you wrote for the rabbi, and it seemed to me that every second phrase was free choice. I gave him as much free choice as he ordered. Herman still had a key to Masha's apartment. He hurried up the stairs and opened the door and saw her standing in the middle of the room. She seemed to have calmed down. All the closets were open, the dresser drawers pulled out. The apartment looked like the tenants were in the midst of moving and had taken everything but the furniture. Herman noticed that the thieves had even unscrewed the light bulbs. Marshall locked the door so that none of the neighbors would come in. 
Then she went into his room, sat down on the bare mattress, and lit a cigarette. Herman sat down beside her. What did you tell your mother about us? The truth? What did she say? The same old story. I'd be sorry. You'd leave me and all the rest of it. If you leave me, you leave me. Only the present counts for me. Herman, this robbery is no ordinary thing. It's a warning that we mustn't stay here any longer. In the Bible it says, Naked I came out of my mother's womb, and naked I will return there. Masha frowned. Why there? We don't return to our mother's wombs. The earth is the mother. Yes, but until we return to her, let's try and live. We must decide right now where to go, California or Florida. We can go by train or bus. The bus is cheaper, but it takes a week to get to California, and you get there more dead than alive. I think we should go to Miami. The rabbi has a home there, and I'll be able to start working right away. When does the bus leave? I'll call and find out. She sprang to her feet. They didn't steal the telephone. They left an old valise, too. Uh, this is how we wandered across Europe. I didn't even have a valise, just a pack. Don't look so miserable. You'll find a job in Florida. If you don't want to write for the rabbi, you can teach. I'm sure you can earn at least forty dollars a week. And with a hundred I make, uh, we can live like kings. Masha's eyes became gay with laughter. The sun shone on her hair, turning it a fiery color. I wouldn't have taken this junk anyhow. Maybe it's a blessing in disguise. Wait here, I'll be right back. I have a few dollars in the bank that I have to withdraw. It'll take about half an hour. Herman heard Masha lock the door behind her. He began to rummage through his books. He found a dictionary he would need if he continued to work for the rabbi, all kinds of notebooks and even an old fountain pen that the thieves had overlooked. He opened his valise and crammed the books into it, but then couldn't shut it. He had an impulse to phone Yadviga, but knew it didn't make sense. He stretched out on the bare bed and slept. When Herman awakened, the sun had gone down and the room was in shadow. Masha had yet to return. Suddenly he heard noises in the hall, footsteps and shouts. It sounded as if something heavy was being dragged up the stairs. Herman got up and opened the door. A man and a woman held Shifra Pua between them, half carrying, half leading her. Her face was sick and altered. Herman recognized the woman as the neighbor who lived in the apartment downstairs. The man saw Herman. She passed out in my taxi. Are you her son? The cab driver handed Herman Schifferpua's purse and overnight bag. Herman paid the cab fare out of his own money. They led Schifferpua into the shadowy bedroom. Herman pushed the light switch, but the bulbs were gone. The cab driver asked why no one turned on a light, and the woman went to get a bulb from her apartment. Schifferpua started to whimper. Why is it so dark in here? Where is Marsha? Oh, woe on my miserable life. Herman held Shifapu by the arm and shoulder. The cab driver left, and the neighbor returned and screwed in the bulb. Shifapu looked at her bed. Where is the bedding? The neighbor said she would get a pillow and sheet and left. Herman led Shifapu to the bed. He could feel her body trembling. She clung to him as he lifted her and lowered her onto the bare mattress. There was the sound of footsteps on the stairs, and Masha entered. Before she could enter the bedroom, Herman called to her through the door. Your mother is here. Marcia stopped in her tracks. She's come running back, has she? Herman came out of the bedroom. She's sick. Marcia went into the bedroom. Herman stood beside the kitchen table. He could hear Marcia yelling at her mother. He knew he should call a doctor, but he didn't know which one to call. He went to his own room. Shortly, he heard the neighbor talking to someone on the telephone. A policeman? Where will I get a policeman? The woman can die in the meantime. Suddenly, Masha ran out of the bedroom. A doctor! A doctor! She's dying! She's killed herself, the bitch, just for spite! 
Masha let out a wail similar to the one Herman had heard over the phone when she told him about the robbery. Her face became contorted. She tore her hair, stamped her feet, leapt at Herman as if to attack him. The neighbor held a phone to her breast, stunned. This is what you wanted! Enemies! Bloody enemies! Masha gasped for breath and doubled over. The neighbor dropped the receiver, grabbed her by the shoulders and shook her. Herman was expecting Masha to call from the hospital, but two hours passed and the phone was silent. Evening fell, and except for the bedroom, the apartment was without light. Herman unscrewed the light bulb from the bedroom fixture to take it to his own room, but on the way bumped into a doorpost and heard the filament rattle. He went to the kitchen to look for matches and candles, but couldn't find any. He stood at the window, looking out into the night. Shouts traffic noises, and the muffled roar of the L echoed in the distance. Herman experienced a melancholy more intense than he had ever felt before. No sooner had the door closed behind him than Herman realized that he had left the key on the kitchen table. He searched through his pockets, knowing he wouldn't find it. The phone began to ring inside the apartment. He pushed at the door, but it was securely locked. The ringing didn't stop. It's Masha, Masha. Herman imagined he could hear Masha's fury and the insistent ringing. He could see her face distorted in agony. But there was nothing he could do. He couldn't even remember to which hospital they had taken Shifrapua. Herman sat down at an empty table in the cafeteria on Tremont Avenue. He decided to wait a half hour, then call the apartment. He took a piece of paper out of his pocket and tried to figure out how long he and Masha could exist in Florida on the money he had. It was futile. He didn't know the price of the bus tickets. He figured, doodled, and every few minutes looked at his wristwatch. Herman felt nauseated in the same way he had on the evening of the rabbi's party. He got up and dialed Masha's number. He could tell from her voice that Shifrapua had died. It was toneless, the exact opposite of the overdramatic style in which she related the most ordinary things. How is your mother? I have no mother. Herman had expected to find a neighbor with Masha, but no one was with her. The apartment was as dark as when he had left it. Masha was standing silently in the middle of the kitchen. Herman led her to his room. It was a little lighter there. He sat down on a chair, and Masha sat down on the edge of the bed. Does anyone know yet? No one knows and no one cares. Shall I call the rabbi? Masha didn't reply. He was beginning to think that in her grief she hadn't heard him. Herman, I can't take any more. These things involve formalities and require money, too. Where is the rabbi? Still at home. I left him there, but he was supposed to fly someplace. I don't remember where. I'll try him at home. Do you have a match? Where's my bag? I'll find it. Herman had to feel his way like a blind man. He felt the surface of the table and the chairs in the kitchen. He wanted to go into the bedroom, but was afraid. He returned to Masha. Could you have left it at the hospital? I had it here. I took the door key out of it. Masha got up, and both of them began to fumble around in the dark. A chair fell over, and Masha picked it up. Herman groped his way to the bathroom and, without thinking, flipped the light switch. The light went on, and he saw Masha's bag on the laundry hamper. The thieves had missed the bulb over the medicine cabinet. Herman phoned the rabbi, and a woman answered. After a brief conversation, he returned to the bedroom. Masha was sitting there with her bag on her knees. The rabbi has gone to California. I see. Where do we begin? Herman's question was directed not only at Masha, but himself. She had once mentioned that neither she nor her mother belonged to any synagogue or burial society. Everything would have to be paid for. The funeral, the cemetery plot. Herman would have to see officials, ask for credit, give guarantees. He thought about animals. They lived without complications and burdened no one when they died. Masha, I don't want to live. You once promised me that we would die together. 
Let's do it now. I have enough sleeping pills for both of us. Yes, let's take them. Herman felt his throat constrict as he choked out the words. The swiftness with which everything had come to a climax baffled him. He could hear the noisy clinking and scraping of keys, coins, lipstick, as Masha rummaged through her bag for the pills. Somehow, he had always suspected that she would be his angel of death. Masha, before we die, I'd like to know the truth. About what? Whether you've been faithful to me. Have you been faithful to me? If you tell the truth, so will I. I'll tell the truth. Wait, I want to get a cigarette. Masha moved with deliberate slowness. Herman could hear her rolling the tip of the cigarette between her thumb and forefinger. She struck a match, and in the glow of the flame her eyes looked at him, questioningly. She inhaled, blew out the flame, and the match had glowed for an instant, illuminating her fingernail. Well, let's hear. Herman spoke with effort. Only with Tamara. That's all. When? At a hotel in the Catskills. You never went to the Catskills. I told you I was going to Atlantic City with Rabbi Lampert to attend a convention. Now it's your turn. Masha gave a short laugh. What you did with your wife, I did with my husband. That means he told the truth. That time, yes. I went to ask him for a divorce, and he insisted. Told me it was the only way I could get it. You swore a holy oath that he lied. I swore falsely. They sat silently, each with his own thoughts. Then Herman said, There isn't any point in dying now. What do you want to do? Leave me? Herman didn't answer. He sat there, his mind blank. Masha, we must leave tonight. Even the Nazis allowed the Jews to bury their dead. We're not Jews anymore, and I can't stay here any longer. What do you want me to do? I'll be damned for ten generations to come. We're damned already. At least let's wait till after the funeral. Herman stood up. I'm leaving now. Wait, I'll go with you. Just let me go into the bathroom a moment. Masha dragged her feet as she walked to the bathroom. The heels of her shoes scraped along the floor. Outside, the tree stood motionless in the night. Herman bade it farewell. He tried one last time to fathom its mystery. He heard water splashing. Masha was apparently washing up. He stood quietly, listening intently, amazed at himself and at Masha's willingness to go with him. She came out of the bathroom. Herman, where are you? Here I am. Herman. I can't leave my mother. You'll have to leave her anyhow. I want a grave next to hers. I don't want to lie among strangers. You'll lie next to me. You're a stranger. Masha, I must go. Wait a second. As long as it's this way, go back to your peasant. Don't leave your child. I will leave everybody. Epilogue The night before Shavuot, Yadviga gave birth to a daughter. The rabbi had suggested that if the child were a girl, she should be called Masha. He had taken care of everything. Shifapua's and Masha's burial, Yadviga's hospital costs. He had bought a baby carriage, blankets, a layette, even toys. Rabbi Abraham Nissen and Shiva Hadass had decided to remain in Israel, and Tamara had taken over her uncle's apartment and bookstore. She had arranged for Yadviga and the baby to move in with her. Masha had left the usual note, saying no one was responsible for her death. She asked to be buried beside her mother. It was two days before anyone knew what had happened. According to a story that was published in a Yiddish newspaper, Masha had appeared to Yasha Kotek, the actor, in a dream, and the following morning Kotek had telephoned Leon Torchener. Torchener, who still had a key to Masha's apartment, found her body. It was Torchener who had phoned the rabbi in California. This story was later refuted in a letter written to the paper by a neighbor of Masha's. The woman maintained that she had called the hospital, learned that Shifapua had died, and that no one had claimed the body. 
She had then called the janitor who opened the apartment, and they had found Masha dead. The rabbi became a frequent visitor to Tamara and to little Masha. He often parked his car in front of the bookstore and came in to browse. He sent her customers and people who either gave her books free or charged her very little. Tamara had several times listed Herman's name in the missing persons section of the Yiddish press, but without results. She believed that Herman had either killed himself or was hiding somewhere in an American version of his Polish hayloft. One day the rabbi informed Tamara that, because of the Holocaust, the rabbinate had eased the restrictions so that a deserted wife could marry a second time. And Tamara had replied, Perhaps in the next world, to Herman. Enemies, a love story by Isaac Singer, adapted and read for book time by William Morantz, was produced in Winnipeg by Dan Wood with the technical assistance of Walter Weed. This is Bill Guest inviting you to join us Monday when book time begins a new series based on What the Crow Said by Robert Croach. <laughs>